Hello, hello, and welcome to another Magic set review, this time for Strixhaven. Quick introduction about my rating system. I use a letter grade system going from S, which is the highest, all the way down to an F. And to give you a few examples from Kaldheim, so you've got some cards to compare to. At the S tier, we had very few cards, but one of those was Starnheim Unleashed, just a very powerful card that can dominate a game by itself. So the S grade goes for ridiculous bombs, cards like Coma, Cosmo Serpent. Then at the A tier, we find ourselves with cards like Dragon King Berserkers. These are still absolute bombs that can take over a game, but maybe not quite as ridiculous as some of the S tier cards. We find powerful sweepers like Blood on the Snow and cards like Toski that can provide an insurmountable amount of card advantage sometimes. Then at the B tier, we find great playables. These will often be cards that can provide some sort of two for one, premium removal spells. So we've got often the best commons will get a B grade, cards like Demon Bolt in Kaldheim. And we find cards like Clarion Spirit, just very efficient creatures that can provide an incremental advantage. Then at C, we find kind of our very good playables that you're very rarely going to cut from a deck if that's playing those corresponding colors. Cards like Ravenous Lindworm became a staple of any green deck in Kaldheim. We had cards like Augury Raven, just nice evasive creatures that can close out a game for you. And a staple of the black deck's Elderfang Disciple, even if black was a little bit underpowered in Kaldheim, it was still a key card in those decks. Then at C, we find often combo tricks, cards like Runamok. So cards that maybe aren't for every deck, but some of the aggressive decks will be interested in them. We find just random filler creatures like Axgard Braggart, cards like Elderleaf Mentor. Then down to the D tier, we find the more conditional cards. These will often be sideboard cards, cards like Invoke the Divine that you're very rarely going to be happy to main deck. Cards like Undersea Invader, just inefficient creatures that don't necessarily are going to make uh, the final cut. Cards like Duskwielder, just a little bit underpowered and uh, not necessarily worth an entire card. Then the F grade is pretty rare and limited these days. These are often reserved for sideboard cards that will maybe see a bit of constructed play or very niche uh, janky cards like Open the Omen Pass, for instance and cards like Weathered Runestone that don't really have any application in Limited. So that's my rating system. So now let's get started with Strixhaven. And it's a good idea typically to look at all the multicolor cards first, since those give you a better idea of what the different uh, color combinations are trying to do in Limited. And we'll start out with Lorehold. So this is the red-white college. And we're starting out with Flame Scroll Celebrant, a 2 mana 2 1 human shaman. And says whenever an opponent activates an ability that isn't a mana ability, Flame Scroll Celebrant deals 1 damage to that player. And then for 1 in a red, we can pump up our Flame Scroll Celebrant, giving it plus 2 plus 7 ton of turn. So just a very solid 2 drop with a nice mana sync ability. Nothing too fancy, but you know, definitely a card you'll always play in a red deck. And then we can also play the back half, which is Revel in Silence. Now, this one is not that exciting. It's a two-mana instant saying your opponents can't cast spells or activate Planeswalker's loyalty abilities this turn, and we exile it. So we're mostly looking at this card for the red half, which is a Flame Scroll Celebrant. So I'm happy giving this a C+, just a great card that you're going to play in any red deck. Next up, we get a Planeswalker right away here. This is Luca Wayward Bonder, although the front half is Mila Crafty Companion, a 3 mana 2 3 legendary fox, saying whenever an opponent attacks one or more Planeswalkers you control, put a loyalty counter on each Planeswalker you control. So that's not going to be very relevant and limited. And then whenever a permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card. So this one is, you know, a bit more impactful and limited, of course. But we're still, you know, playing a 3-mana 2-3, which isn't super exciting. And then the Planeswalker half is Luka, Wayward Bonder, 6-mana, 5 loyalty, plus 1, says we may discard a card if we do draw a card, and if we discarded a creature card, we get to draw 2 instead, so it can provide some card filtering. 
Then the minus two returns a creature from our graveyard to the battlefield, gains haste, and we have to exile it at the beginning of our next upkeep. And then the minus seven ultimate, which we can reach after a couple turns, gives us an emblem saying whenever a creature enters a battlefield under our control, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. So a pretty powerful ultimate ability. But the Planeswalker itself doesn't necessarily protect himself all that well with the plus and minus two. So it is definitely a card you want to play on a stable board and uh, not necessarily a card that's going to catch you back up if you're very far behind. But that being said, you do get the flexibility of the creature half as well. So overall, not the best Planeswalker ever, but definitely playable, so I'm happy giving this a B. And you can also consider playing this in a deck that maybe only can cast one of the two halves. Next up we've got another dual face card with Augusta, Dean of Order. And the front half, Plarg, Dean of Chaos, a 2 mana, 2 2 legendary orc shaman, taps and discards a card to draw cards, so a nice looter effect that doesn't cost us any additional mana, which is nice. And then for 5 mana, we can tap it, reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal a non legendary, non land card with mana value 3 or less. Mana value is the new way to describe converted mana cost. And then we may cast that card without paying its mana cost and put all revealed cards on the bottom of our library in a random order. So the ability is not super exciting here, the 5 mana one, but getting to loot, discard and draw is always very useful and limited. Get rid of those extra lands in the late game that we don't need. So yeah, Plark definitely a pretty high value card. And then uh, we have the back half here with Augusta, Dean of Order, 3 mana 1, 3, saying... Author tapped creatures you control get plus one plus O, and author untapped creatures you control get plus O plus one. And whenever we attack, untap each creature we control and then tap any number of creatures you control. So this card is a bit of a headache to keep track of. So can definitely make combat a nightmare for the opponent and gives you a lot of options on what to tap and what to untap. So yeah, overall this card seems quite strong, definitely worthy of at least a B. And once again, a card you can consider playing even if you're only playing one of the two colors. Next up, we've got Blade Historian. This is a hybrid card, so we can pay red or white mana to pay for the casting cost here. And we get a 2-3 Human Cleric saying attacking creatures we control have double strike. So this is incredibly impactful, even the turn you play it. Just have to be careful that the opponent doesn't have instant speed removal to remove your double strike out of nowhere. So that's something to keep in mind. But yeah, this card is an incredible beating, and as long as you're red-white and uh, can easily cast this around turn 4, this is going to be very hard to beat if you've got any board presence in play already. So happy giving this an A, definitely a bomb level card. Next up we have Hofri, a Ghost Forge, a 5 mana for 5 legendary creature dwarf cleric at Mythic, saying spirits you control get plus 1 plus 1 and have trample and haste. And as you'll notice, red white does have a pretty big spirit theme, not only making spirit tokens, but lots of creatures just have the spirits creature type as well. And then whenever another non-token creature you control dies, exile it. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a spirit in addition to its other types. And then when that creature leaves the battlefield, it returns the exiled card to your graveyard, so it doesn't actually get rid of it forever. So overall, yeah, for 5 that gives our spirit plus 1 plus 1, trample and haste, and then if our creatures die, they basically come back as spirits. So an incredibly difficult card to beat, unless you can remove Hofri himself. So yeah, another bomb level card, definitely worthy of an A. Next we have Lorehord Apprentice, 2 mana for a 2-2 Human Cleric with Magecraft. First time seeing the Magecraft keyword, which basically says whenever we cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell until end of turn, a certain effect will happen. In this case, spirit creatures we control gain the ability to tap, and then this creature deals 1 damage to each opponent. So Red White does have a small spirit theme and you might end up with a few incidental spirits in play. That being said, not the most impressive Magecraft ability we'll come across today, but uh, still definitely fine playable card, so can't really give this less than a C, and uh, yeah, overall probably just a C, since it is a little difficult to cast for 2-drop. Next up we have Lorehold Command, 5 mana for an instant. We'll see a cycle of these commands for each college, this one lets us choose two between create a 3-2 red and white spirit creature token. Creatures you control get plus one plus so and gain indestructible and haste until end of turn. 
Command deals 3 damage to any target and target player gains 3 life. And finally, sacrifice a permanent and then draw two cards. So almost every single one of these abilities has some application, and getting to choose two of them will make this uh, an absolute beating to face for the opponent. So yeah, I think this is an A-level command. I don't think many of them will get up to an A, but uh, Lower Hold commands one of the more expensive ones and is quite impactful, and it's usually not too difficult to get a nice 2-for-1, even 3-for-1 uh, if you can line it up well. So this card seems great. Next up we have Lorehold Excavation, a 2-mana enchantment, saying at the beginning of your end step, mill a card. If a land card was milled this way, you gain one life, otherwise Excavation deals 1 damage to each opponent, so a bit of incidental life gain and damage. And then for 5 mana we can exile a creature card from our graveyard to create a tapped 3-2 red and white spirit creature token. So it gives us a nice late game mana sink. Now, do keep in mind Lorehold does have a lot of this graveyard recursion and exiling going on, so it does have a bit more synergy than you might expect. Lorehold is not your typical Boros aggro deck that's going to want to play a bunch of creatures and turn them sideways. It can definitely play this more grindy, controlling game of getting value out of the graveyard. So in those decks that can play that longer game, Excavation is going to be a pretty nice engine card. So overall, land on a C plus for Lorehold Excavation. A bit of a build around, not the fastest card, but can definitely provide a lot of advantage over a long game. Then we have Lorehold Pledge Mage, a hybrid card, so this one you could potentially play in the black-white deck or the blue-red deck as well, so that's something else to keep in mind. This is a 2-2 Core Shaman with First Strike and Magecraft, says the Pledge Mage gets plus one plus so until end of turn. So pretty mediocre Magecraft ability, but definitely relevant, especially if you can combine it with an instant, giving him one additional power out of nowhere. So Pledge Mage... You know, fine playable, nothing too exciting, but uh, also nice in multiples. If you get multiple first strike creatures, they play defense quite well. So happy giving this a C. Then we have Make Your Mark, a one mana instant, once again a hybrid card, so can potentially be played in other decks too, giving target creature plus one plus so until end of turn. And when that creature dies at this turn, we get to make a 3 2 red and white spirit creature token. So a nice little combo trick that maybe upgrades one of our smaller creatures into a 3 2 spirit token if a trade happens. So it seems like a totally fine combo trick if we're in the market for combo tricks. So this gets a C. Then we have Quintorius, Field Historian, 5 mana for a 2-4, Legendary, Elephant, Cleric, and Uncommon, saying Spirits we control get plus 1 plus 0, oh, so once again a nice Anthem effect for Spirits, and whenever one or more cards leave our graveyard, create a 3-2 red and white Spirit creature token. So remember the Lorehold Excavation, for instance, that can exile cards from our graveyard, that's another way to enable Quintorius, and there's a couple more cards that enable those synergies. So Quintorius seems like a pretty important card for the grindy red-white Lorehold deck. So this gets a B from me. Then we've got a Radiant Scroll Wielder, 4 mana for a 2-4 Dwarf Cleric at rare, saying instant and sorcery spells we control have lifelink. So that's relevant if we've got some red burn spells that deal damage, they'll now gain life as well. And at the beginning of our upkeep, exile an instant or sorcery card at random from our graveyard, and we may cast it this turn. If a spell cast this way would be put into our graveyard, it gets exiled instead, so we can't keep getting back the same spells over and over. But yeah, Scroll Wilder seems great, as long as we have some removal spells, ideally red ones. We can get a ton of value over the course of a game with a Scroll Wilder, and a 2-4 body is also not too bad. So happy giving this an A, seems like a bomb level card and doesn't require too much build around for it to be a great card in your deck, since you're going to want those removal spells anyway. Reconstruct History, 4 mana, Sorcery at Uncommon, saying return up to 1 target artifact card, up to 1 target enchantment card, and up to 1 target instant card, and up to 1 target sorcery card, and up to 1 target planeswalker card, from your graveyard to your hand, and then exile Reconstruct History. So it has the potential to generate a pretty big advantage. Now keep in mind the most important uh, card type, which is creature, is not mentioned here. So it doesn't get back creatures, just all the other ones. So a deck usually doesn't have too many of those non-creature spells in it, so 
uh, even though you could potentially gain a lot of advantage and red white is a deck that potentially wants to fill the graveyard and get value it's still going to be kind of tricky to get more than a two for one with the reconstruct history and even then we're talking about a very late game and you do need to kind of build your deck around it to have a lot of those different card types so not the biggest fan of reconstruct history but you know can definitely provide a pretty big advantage in the right deck that being said on average i think this is probably just going to be a d and i'm not going to draft it very highly then we've got a relic sloth five mana for four beast with vigilance and menace so just a very nicely standard creature with some good abilities. Menace, of course, combines nicely with combo tricks since the opponent's going to be forced to potentially double block the sloth. And then Vigilance plays offense and defense nicely. So yeah, if you've got any sort of combo tricks to combine with the sloth, it gets even better. But overall, I'm happy giving this a C+. Seems like a card you're going to play in almost every red-white deck. Potentially even splashable. Then we've got Returns Past Caller. A 6 mana 4 2 Spirit Cleric with flying, saying when the Pass Caller enters the battlefield, return target Spirit, instant, or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. So, kind of a built in 2 for 1. There's plenty of Spirits and Red Whites, so can get back creatures as well. And then, of course, if we get back a nice removal spell, that's great value. And then a 4 2 Flyer is an actual threat that can close out the game. So, Pass Caller seems quite good, at least a B, even if it's pretty pricey to get out there. Then rip apart a 2-mana sorcery, lets us choose one between dealing 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker, or destroying target artifact or enchantment. So just a very versatile card. For limited, we're mostly interested in the 3 damage to a creature, but even so, at 2 mana, this is incredibly efficient. So very good removal spell, which gets a B from me. This is our first lesson card. So as you'll notice in Strixhaven, there's a bunch of cards that have the lesson subtype. So this is a 3-mana Sorcery Spirit Summoning, creating a 3-2 red and white Spirit Creature Token. So the Lesson cards are cards you typically are going to want to start in the sideboard, since we'll come across cards with the Learn mechanic that lets you put one of those sideboard cards into your hand. And that means that every single Lesson card kind of goes up in value, since you can potentially get access to them with all the Learn cards. And overall, I'm going to be giving all these uh, lesson cards a pretty high grade because of that, uh, more than you would expect typically. So while in a normal set, 3 mana for a 3-2 is nothing special, the fact that this is a lesson means it's actually pretty important. And I'm happy giving Spirit Summoning a B. And as you'll notice, I'm going to give almost all the summoning cards a B grade. Then we've got Stonebound Mentor, 3 mana for a 3-3 Spirit Advisor, saying whenever one or more cards leave our graveyard, we get to scry one. Yeah, totally fine card, 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, reasonable stats, and has a bit of added upside, especially given the red-white college wants to exile a bunch of cards out of the graveyard, as we've seen already. So this gets a C plus from me. Thrilling Discovery is 2 mana for a sorcery, we gain 2 life, then we may discard 2 cards if we do draw 3. So essentially Cathartic Reunion, but we also gain 2 life. Red White wants to be filling the graveyard and Thrilling Discovery helps us with that. And uh, you know, you always get to those late game situations where you want to discard a few extra lanes and hopefully draw into some action. So Thrilling Discovery gets a C, not a card necessarily every Red White deck is going to want, but nothing wrong with it. Then we have Velomachus Lorehold, this is the Elder Dragon, and as we'll see, every single one of the colleges has an Elder Dragon representing it. And this is a 7 mana, 5-5, five, five, Dragon with Flying, Vigilance and Haste. And whenever Velomachus attacks, we'll look at the top 7 cards of our library, we may cast an instant or sorcery spell with mana value less than or equal to Velomachus' power from among them without paying its mana cost, and the rest goes on the bottom. So, incredibly powerful card. Of course, we do pay a price for it. Seven mana is no joke. But if Velomachus survives and uh, we get to connect with him a few times, it's usually going to be game over. And even if the opponent does have an answer, we usually get at least one trigger out of it. So we get a bit of value. So this gets an A, maybe not quite an S, but uh, definitely a powerful card. And also very splashable. Then we have a Venerable Warsinger, three mana for a 3-3 three, three Spirit Cleric with Vigilance and Trample, and whenever the Warsinger deals combo damage to a player, we may return target creature card with mana value X or less from our graveyard to the battlefield where X is the amount of damage the Warsinger dealt to that player. 
Now having a 3-3 connect with the opponent is not always going to be easy, so this would be nice alongside some combat tricks or ways to make it bigger. But overall, nothing, nothing wrong with the card. A 3-3 with nice stats, Vigilance and Trample, so it's all upside here. And if we do get to ever connect with the opponent, we can potentially get a lot of value. So Warsinger gets a B. Then we've covered all the Lorehold cards here. So that gave you an idea of what Lorehold is all about. Filling the graveyard, exiling things out of the graveyard. We've got some Spirit Synergy. So that's important to keep in mind as we'll eventually evaluate the mono red and mono white cards in the set. Then next up we've got the Prismari College, which is blue red. And we start out strong here with a Planeswalker, a dual face Planeswalker. Rowan, Scholar of Sparks, is 3 mana, starts at 2 loyalty, saying instant and sorcery spells we cast, cost 1 generic mana, less to cast. Then the plus 1 deals 1 damage to each opponent, and if we've drawn 3 or more cards this turn, deals 3 damage to each opponent instead. And then the minus 4 gives us an emblem saying whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, we may pay 2 generic mana, and if we do, we get to copy that spell and choose new targets. But the card we're going to cast most often, and that we're more excited about, is Will, Scholar of Frost. 5 mana, starts out at 4 loyalty, has the same cost reduction effect. And then the plus 1 says up to 1 target creature has a base, power and toughness 0-2 until or next turn. So it can shrink something down from the opponent to protect our Planeswalker. Then the minus 3 lets us draw 2 cards, so if we want to we can get immediate value. And then the minus 7 ultimate says exile up to 5 target permanents, and for each permanent exile this way its controller creates a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token. So will is mostly going to be used for the plus 1 and minus 3 ability, and of course that cost reduction also cannot be ignored. So just a very powerful planeswalker with a ton of flexibility since we can always play the other half as well. Although I would only really be excited about this card if we get Get access to the blue half since the red one is a lot less interesting. So overall this gets an A, just a powerful planeswalker that will make it very difficult for the opponent if they can't remove it right away. Next up we have another dual faced card. This is Torrent Sculptor, a 4 mana 2-2 Merfolk Wizard with a ward 2. So this is a new mechanic introduced in Strixhaven and is essentially kind of the fixed way of uh, dealing with hexproof. So ward says whenever this creature becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, counter it unless that player pays 2 in this case, although we'll see ward uh, mechanics that are slightly different where instead of having to pay mana the opponent maybe has to pay a life instead so kind of the fixed tax proof which is nice to see so Torrent Sculptor 4 mana 2-2 two, two with Ward 2 and whenever Torrent Sculptor enters a battlefield exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard and put a number of plus 1 plus 1 counters on Torrent Sculptor equal to half of that card's mana value rounded up and as we'll see there's a couple expensive instants and sorceries in the Prismari College that let you discard them at a low cost and that means we can potentially put those in the graveyard ready for Torn Sculptor to then turn them into a bunch of plus one plus one counters so that's an important synergy to keep track of as well. Uh, of course getting those counters on a creature with ward means it's going to be more difficult for the opponent to remove so we are not you know investing a ton of resources into a creature that can easily get dealt with. And then we also have the flexibility of playing Flamethrower Sonata, 2 mana sorcery, saying a discard a card and then draw a card. And when we discard an instant or sorcery card this way, the Sonata deals damage equal to that card's mana value to target creature or planeswalker we don't control. So if we have multiples of these, they also synergize with each other since we can potentially discard one of those expensive instants or sorceries to get a better effect with Sonata and that will power up our wizard afterwards. But uh, of course here we're mostly interested in the creature half, but every now and then the removal spell can come in handy, so once again the flexibility is what makes this card so powerful. Yeah, I think I landed on a B for Torrent Sculptor. It is powerful, but of course it requires a little bit of setup, and if you don't have anything in the graveyard, then Torrent Sculptor is going to be not the most exciting card. But as we mentioned, Prismari does have a few expensive instants and sorceries to combo with it, and then it becomes a much more interesting cards to uh, play with. 
Next up, we has, have another dual face card with Nasari, Dean of Expression, 5 mana, 4 4, legendary, a freed shaman, saying at the beginning of our upkeep, exile the top card of each opponent's library. Until end of turn, we may cast spells from among those exiled cards, and we may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. And whenever we cast a spell from exile, put a plus one plus one counter on Nasari. So a nice way to generate card advantage through the opponent's library and get a nice creature at the same time, so this card seems great. And we even get the flexibility of a second half here with Uvilda, Dean of Perfection, 3 mana, 2-2. Two, two. I guess this is the front side and the Shaman is the back half. Either way, Uvilda is a 3 mana, 2-2 two, two legendary Jin Wizard that can tap, and then we may exile an instant or sorcery card from our hand and put 3 Hone counters on it. And at the beginning of our upkeep, we can essentially remove a Hone counter, and if the last counter is removed, we get to cast it at a reduced cost of 4 generic mana. So powerful alongside those expensive instants and sorceries, although I expect most of the time to be interested in casting the uh, Nasari half of the card, which you know has a bit more built-in card advantage and doesn't require any other cards for it to be good. But the flexibility, again, is what makes this even better. So overall I'm happy giving this an A, since it's a way to repeatedly gain card advantage and have a nice threat at the same time. Then we have Creative Outburst. This is the first of these expensive instants and sorceries that we'll see. This is a 7 mana instant, and Creative, Out creative Outburst deals 5 damage to any target. We can look at the top 5 cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, and the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order. And for a hybrid blue-red, Two of those, we can discard Creative Outburst to create a treasure token. So if we just need to ramp into another one of these expensive instances of sorceries, we do have the flexibility of just uh, converting this into a treasure token, which is not ideal since using too many of those to make treasure tokens is a pretty big card disadvantage. But if the effect is powerful enough, it can kind of make up for it if we can cast another one of these instances of sorceries. And as we mentioned, this also has good synergy with the uh, Torrent Sculpture, which can then pick up more plus one plus one counters. Overall, I land on Creative Outburst getting a C+, powerful but expensive, so you have to be careful not to have too many of those in your deck without the sufficient uh, ways to ramp into it. Then we have Culmination of Studies X, a blue and a red for a rare sorcery. Exiles the top X cards of our library. For each land card exiled this way, we get to make a treasure token. For each blue card exiled this way, we get to draw a card. And for each red card exiled this way, it deals one damage to each opponent. So it takes a while to parse what's going on with Culmination of Studies. But the end result is a pretty weak card that is only really exciting if you manage to exile multiple blue cards. Although at that point, you know, you're exiling a lot of cards, drawing a lot of cards, there's always the risk of milling yourself, which could definitely come up if you cast a big culmination of studies. And a deck, you know, if your deck is evenly split between blue and red, you're equally likely to just deal a bit of damage to the opponent, and uh, that's not really too exciting. So I don't think this card's very good, uh, but, you know, in a heavy blue deck where you're just splashing a few red cards, it may be playable, but overall I'm giving this a D. Then we've got Elemental Expressionists for Blue-Red Hybrid Mana for a 4-4 Orc Wizard with Magecraft, saying Choose target creature you control until end of turn it gains if this creature would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. And when we exile this creature we get to make a 4-4 Blue and Red Elemental Creature Token. So... Yeah, pretty complicated card, but at the end of the day, essentially means we can potentially upgrade some of our smaller creatures into 4-4 elementals, and this is also 4-4 itself, so pretty good stance, especially in blue-red, which typically doesn't get these very big creatures, and plays well alongside cheap instants, combat tricks, etc., that can potentially trigger magecraft at instant speed. Not quite at uh, A level, but easily worthy of a B, and probably a B plus if we were making that distinction. Then we've got Elemental Masterpiece, 7 mana sorcery common, creating 2 4 4 blue and red elemental creature tokens, and also has the ability to discard it for 2 mana to create a treasure token. So once again expensive, but powerful, so if we can get to it, and our deck has sufficient ways of ramping into it, it's definitely powerful and having that fail case of just making a treasure token is always nice. 
So this also gets a C plus from me. Going to be a nice common in the Prismari deck. Then we have another summoning, so another lesson card, which as I've mentioned, I'm going to give a pretty high grade. This one for five mana makes a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token, and the hybrid casting cost makes this one very flexible as well, so can easily play it in the red-white deck as a lesson you can grab out of the sideboard, or in the blue-green deck. So great cards, and I'm going to give this a B as well. Expressive Iteration is a 2-mana sorcery add-on common, lets us look at the top 3 cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, put one of them on the bottom of our library, and exile one of them, and we may play the exiled card this turn. So, pretty interesting card. The best way to use Iteration is probably to play it after turn 2, and then we can exile a land, assuming we have a land in the top 3, which is pretty likely, and this says we may play the Exiled card, it doesn't specify casting it, so we can also play lands with it. And, you know, if we're playing a land, we guaranteed get a bit of value from the Exiled card, so we don't run the risk of having too many expensive cards and not getting to cast them all. And then we also get to draw a card. So it's, you know, often going to be an easy 2 for 1 for 2 mana, although with the caveat that we can't really cast it on turn 2, because then we can't play the extra land since we've already played a land for the turn. But in the late game, if you just need action, then you can kind of ignore the lands part of the card and just uh, try and cast two spells with it. So seems pretty good and gets a B from me. Also a good way to potentially enable Magecraft multiple times in the late game. Our next Elder Dragon is Galazeth Prismari. Four mana for a 3-4 legendary creature with flying. And when Galazeth enters the battlefield, create a treasure token and artifacts we control can tap to add one mana of any color, and we can spend this mana only to cast instant or sorcery spells. So Galazeth is great, 3 for flyer for 4 is already good, we even get some additional ramp and turns all our treasure tokens into permanent mana artifacts instead of having to sacrifice them. So yeah, Galazeth gets an A from me, just an absolute bomb and great enabler for the expensive Prismari instants and sorceries. Then we've got Maelstrom Muse, a 4-mana 2-4 Jin Wizard with flying, saying when the Muse attacks, the next instant or sorcery spell we cast this turn costs X less to cast, where X is the Muse's power as this ability resolves. So without any additional work, this will give us a 2-mana discount if we attack, and a 2-4 Flyer is usually going to be able to attack unopposed. And getting a 2-mana discount on those expensive 7-mana sorceries is a big deal. They also curve into each other nicely. Turn 4, play the Muse. Turn 5, attack, get a 2-mana discount, cast a 7-mana sorcery. So that plays out very nicely. So this is the perfect enabler for the Prismari deck and gets a B from me. Magma Opus, an 8-mana Mythic Rare Instant which deals 4 damage divided as we choose among any number of targets. We get to tap 2 target permanents, and we get to make a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token, and we get to draw 2 cards. So an incredible amount of value here if we can get to 8 mana, which is not a given, but this is the type of card where you're potentially willing to sacrifice a few cards along the way to create treasure tokens, so we can cast Magma Opus, which will more than likely make up for the card disadvantage along the way. And we also have the flexibility once again of discarding Magma Opus for 2 mana to create a treasure token. So this card seems great, as long as we have a few ways of ramping into it, like we saw with the Djinn just before this. So this gets an A from me. Then we've got Ogyar Battleseer, a 5 mana 3-4 Ogre Shaman with haste and can tap to scry 1. Interesting card, usually haste creatures want to get in the red zone. As a 3-4 this is relatively large but not necessarily large enough where it can always attack right away but getting to tap and scry one thanks to haste right away also means that if it can't attack it can still play defense and then end of turn scry and help us set up those expensive instants and sorceries in the prismary colors and especially in a deck that has such a big difference between mana costs and needs to hit its land drops to get to seven or eight mana the scry one is especially valuable, so yeah, I like the Battle Seer quite a bit for the Prismari deck, and uh, overall give it a C plus. Practical Research, 5 mana instant at Uncommon, 
lets us draw four cards and then we discard two cards unless we discard an instant or sorcery card. So discarding an instant or sorcery is not going to be too difficult in Prismari, but even if it's just a draw four, discard two author cards, it's not too bad. And being an instant means we can potentially play with it in a deck that has a couple counter spells or author instant speed interaction, making it even better. So yeah, I like practical research quite a bit. Powerful card draw spell, just have to be careful not to play too many card draw spells that don't impact the board, otherwise you're going to fall behind. But having a couple of these sprinkled throughout your Prismari deck is going to make it even more powerful. So I like B for practical research. Prismari Apprentice is one of the apprentices that's kind of part of a cycle here as well, as we'll see. Two mana for a 2-2 human shaman with magecraft. And if we enable Magecraft, the Apprentice cannot be blocked this turn. And if that spell had mana value 5 or greater, we also get to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the Apprentice. So, you know, Blue Rat typically wants to set up these big expensive instants and sorceries. So it's not necessarily the most aggressive color combination. So this Apprentice is a little bit at odds with what the college wants to be doing. That being said, it's a 2 mana 2-2. Two -two can get in some evasive damage and can pick up a few plus one counters along the way so there's nothing inherently wrong with the card even if it's maybe a little bit awkward in what the college is trying to do as a whole but it's still a, a very good card and gets a c plus then we've got the prismari command three mana for an instant at rare and once again we get to choose two this one deals two damage to any target or target player draws two cards and then discards two cards, so kind of a faithful looting. Then target player creates a treasure token, giving us some ramp, or we can destroy target artifact. So the modes we're going to use most often are probably the top three, but having the flexibility of every now and then destroying an artifact is nice, so it's just added upside. So very cheap, and uh, again, ton of flexibility here, so there's a lot to like about Prismari Command, and I'm happy giving this a B. Then we've got Prismari Pledge Mage, 2 mana hybrid for a 3-3 Orc Wizard with Defender, and Magecraft makes it lose Defender until end of turn, or makes it attack as if it didn't have Defender. So this is more along the lines of what Prismari wants to have out of a 2-drop, something that can be played early, protect your life total, is difficult for the opponent to attack past, and then, you know, eventually can potentially turn sideways if you're ready to start attacking and close out the game. So Pledge Mage seems perfect for Prismari, and happy giving this a C+. Rutha, a Mercurial Artist, is a 3-mana 1-4 Legendary Orc Shaman, and for 2-mana we can return a Rutha to our hand and copy target instant or sorcery spell we control and choose new targets for the copy. So we cast an instant or sorcery and then we can activate the ability essentially. And in the meantime we get a 1-4 that can block pretty well. So while it is going to be tricky to copy a very expensive instant or sorcery with the ability, since, you know, assuming we cast one of those 7 mana ones, having 2 additional mana on top of that to copy it is going to be difficult but it could come up in the late game and even just copying some random two or three mana instant or sorcery is good value. And then we can still redeploy Rutha to copy a future one. So it's just all upside and we get a 1-4 creature to play defense in the meantime. Don't think I'm quite going up to a B, but at least a C plus for Rutha. Then we've got Spectacle Mage, three mana for a 2-2 Bird Shaman. At common it flies and Instant and sorcery spells we cast with mana value 5 or greater cost 1 generic mana less to cast. So a bit of a goblin electromancer effect, but only applies to expensive instants and sorceries. But that's still exactly what the Prismari College wants to do. It wants to cast those expensive instants and sorceries as a kind of a powerful way to take over the game. And anything that helps us in that quest is going to be very valuable to us. So Spectacle Mage uh, definitely is part of that. So... I like Spectacle Mage quite a bit, C+. Then Teach by example, 2 mana hybrids for an instant, saying when we cast our next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell, and we may choose new targets for the copy. So this one is interesting. Usually these copy effects or fork effects, like they're known in Magic, are not very good in Limited, since they require you to have 
a lot of instants and sorceries in your deck, which is not always a given. So then if you draw Teach by example by itself, it doesn't do anything. Now, that being said, there's a few things that make this better than it would be in a normal set. First off, we have all the lesson cards, which are going to be cards we can copy with Teach by example. So we're going to more frequently have access to instants and sorceries we can copy. Then another thing that this has going for it is that it's a very good magecraft enabler, because if we cast a spell, then we cast each by example, and then we get a copy, which also triggers magecraft. We're getting, you know, three magecraft triggers for only two cards used, which could be relevant. That being said, I'm still not very high on teach by example, but I still wanted to point out those potential synergies. So it still gets a D for me but I could definitely see a deck where Teach by Example is going to be quite powerful, but it's probably going to be a deck using cheaper instants and sorceries as opposed to the typical Prismari deck, which I expect is going to be interested in casting those expensive ones. And that's all of Prismari. So, you know, we saw most of what the college is trying to do, cast expensive instants and sorceries. It cares about Magecraft maybe a little bit more than other colleges and... Uh, has definitely a lot of card advantage and removal if you can make those cards work. Next up is Quandrix Blue Green, and we start out strong with Augmenter Pugilist, a 3 mana 3 3 Troll Druid with Trample, saying as long as we control 8 or more lands, Augmenter Pugilist gets plus 5 plus 5, so turns into an 8 8 Trampler. So this card is quite a beating, and we're not even done yet. There's also a back half, which is Echoing Equation, 5 mana for a sorcery, saying choose target creature we control, each other creature we control becomes a copy of it until end of turn, and legendary doesn't matter. Probably going to be more interested in the creature half here, the Pugilist, and this also highlights one of the mechanics in blue-green, which is trying to get up to 8 lands to make some of your cards better. And the Pugilist is already good by itself as a 3 mana 3-3 three, three Trampler, so it's all added upside, making this a very powerful card overall. So I'm happy giving this an A. Then we have Jansi, Oracle of Arcavios, in 8 mana, a legendary human wizard. It's a 5-5, five five, and we can discard a card to return a Jansi to its owner's hand. So a nice built-in protection. And this has Magecraft, letting us reveal the top card of our library. If it's a non-land card, we may cast it by paying one generic mana rather than paying its mana cost. And if it's a land card, we can put it on the battlefield instead. So one of the more powerful Magecraft abilities we're going to come across. And then we also have the flexibility of playing a journey to the Oracle, a four mana sorcery, saying we may put any number of land cards from our hand onto the battlefield. And then if we control eight or more lands, we may discard a card if we do return a journey to the oracle to its owner's hand. Don't imagine we're going to be casting journey too often in limited since it's not often that you still have a lot of lands in hand by the time you get to four mana. But again, it's just a flexibility here that's nice so we don't have to cast journey if we don't want to. And then once we do eventually get to eight mana, Jalzi has built-in protection, can provide a ton of card advantage. So this card seems great, and I'm happy giving this an A. Next up we have another dual-faced card. The front half is Kian, Dean of Substance, a 3-mana 2-2 legendary elf druid. Can tap to exile the top card of our library. If it's a land card, put it into your hand, otherwise put a study counter on it, and it will stay in exile. And then for 4 and a green, we create a 0-0 green and blue fractal creature token. Put a plus one plus one counter on it for each different mana value among a non-land cards we own in exile with a study counter on it. So this also highlights one of the mechanics in blue-green, which are these fractal creature tokens. They start out as zero zeros, but they pick up plus one plus one counters. So Kian is a nice way to potentially hit our land drops and eventually gives us a mana sink ability. But the card we're probably more interested in is Ibrahim, a Dean of Theory, a 4-mana 3-3 three, three, legendary bird wizard with flying. And for X and double blue, we can tap Ibrahim and exile the top X cards of our library and put a study counter on each of them. And then we may put a card we own in exile with a study counter on it into our hand. So essentially draws us cards or lets us take a look at the top X cards and then draw one of them. And we can still draw a card we exiled in a previous turn potentially. So just nice clean card advantage and at the same time a 4-mana 3-3 three, three flyer, which is not too bad. 
So overall, this card seems great and once again offers us a ton of flexibility. So I like A for Kian slash Imbraham. Next up is Aether Helix, 5 mana for a sorcery at uncommon, returning target permanent to its owner's hand, and then return target permanent card from our graveyard to our hand. So it's a bound spell, and at the same time we're getting a bit of value out of the graveyard. Now it does specify permanent cards, so it doesn't get back instants or sorceries, which can potentially be uh, a drawback. But overall, this card seems quite good. It gives us a bit of tempo by bouncing an opposing creature. And um, that tempo we can leverage by then casting the card we got back from the graveyard, so we don't fall too far behind on board for casting a 5 mana sorcery. Now, something else that's important to point out is that because this set potentially ends up with these large fractal tokens, bouncing a creature is even more valuable than it would otherwise be. So the fact that we get to return a permanent and potentially bounce a large fractal token from the opponent could be even better than it would be in a regular set. So overall, I'm pretty high on Aether Helix, and I'm happy giving this a B. Next up is Biomathematician, a 3-mana 2-2 human wizard, and when the Mathematician enters a battlefield, create a 0-0 green and blue fractal creature token, and we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each fractal we control. So by itself, it's a 2-2 that essentially makes a 1-1 token, and potentially has a lot more value if we have other fractal tokens in play. So great card, and uh, easily gets a C+, and in some build-around decks that have even more fractal tokens, this might get even better. Body of Research is triple blue and triple green for a mythic rare sorcery, creating a 0-0 green and blue fractal creature token, and then we put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is the number of cards in our library. On average, we can count on at least having around 20 cards left in our library when we cast this. So it essentially makes a token that can one-hit KO the opponent. And uh, yeah, that's pretty good. The opponent will have to, at all times, have a creature back on defense to chum block. And, you know, hopefully you're able to attack with it and you don't have to keep the giant token on defense. Of course, if the opponent has removal at the ready, it's just going to be a 6 mana creature that dies, but there's not that many removal spells that cleanly take care of this, and even though we did just cover a bound spell, there's not that many bound spells in the set, because they probably didn't want easy answers for big fractal tokens, so overall the risk of running into a bound spell isn't super high, so body of research gets an A from me, which is very powerful, although if the opponent has the right answers, it doesn't necessarily win the game on the spot. Then we've got Decisive Denial, 2 mana instant at uncommon, lets us choose one between target creature we control fights, target creature we don't control, or counter target a non-creature spell unless its controller pays 3 generic mana. So the flexibility once again is what makes this card good. If it was only one of the two, it wouldn't be too exciting. We get essentially instant speed prey upon, and we get a slightly worse negate which, you know, doesn't necessarily describe a very good card, but getting both is what makes this so nice. Can pass a turn, keep up our mana, and if they play something worth countering, we can counter. If they make us use our fight effect, which we can use at instant speed, can also potentially be a blowout. So, yeah, pretty nice card. Overall, happy giving the Decisive Denial a C+, just a... Nice, flexible card that you're going to be happy to have in any Quandrix deck. Next up is Double Major. Blue and a green for an instant at rare. Says copy target creature spell we control, except it isn't legendary if the spell is legendary. So copying a creature spell is different from copying a creature that's already in play. Essentially means we need to cast a creature, and with the creature on the stack we cast our Double Major to get a copy, which does make this card pretty awkward to use because we need two mana on top of whatever creature we're casting and if we want to copy something powerful you know that's going to mean we're going to need even more mana to make that happen so not a big fan of double major and i'm going to give this a d just a bit too difficult to make it work then eureka moment four mana instant at common lets us draw two and then we may put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield so a juiced up growth spiral and uh, growth spiral as we'll see a bit later is actually in one of the mystical archive slots so 
whereas Gross Spiral wasn't too impressive in the original printing, where Simic wasn't really too interested in ramping, it is different in Quandrix, because Quandrix is gonna wanna have access to more mana to get up to eight lands in play to enable some of its synergies. So any Gross Spiral effect is gonna be quite valuable and Eureka Moment lets us draw two cards as well. So four mana for two cards is more or less what we expect at instant speed. And we potentially get to ramp as well. And this is the color that is definitely interested in ramping. So overall, I'm pretty happy with Eureka Moment. Probably a C plus, although I would be tempted to give it a B, but I'll start out, start out with a C plus and then I'll be happy to potentially increase its grade later. Then we have Fractal Summoning X and Blue-Green Hybrid times two for a sorcery lesson, so part of the lesson cycle. And as you'll notice, all the lessons in the respective colleges make creature tokens. And this one makes a 0, zero green and blue fractal creature and then put X plus one plus one counters on it. So a nice X spell, not incredibly efficient if we're casting it for low amounts, but once we get to X equals four or five, then we get an actual creature. And once again, this is a lesson, so we can grab it out of the sideboard, making it pretty valuable. And this can also easily be cast in the Prismari College where, you know, you're trying to ramp into big sorceries anyway, so it fits in nicely. And in uh, green-black can also have some applications as potentially a cheap creature we can sacrifice. So overall, pretty high on Fractal Summoning, as I am on pretty much all these summoning cards. So I'll give this a B as well, even though it might not look like a very impressive card. And now do keep in mind that this is a grade I'm giving to a card we can play in the sideboard, and I'm not you know, excited about playing this in my main deck. Then we've got Golden Ratio, 3 mana, Sorcery at Uncommon. Let's just draw a card for each different power among creatures we control. So good synergy with all the Fractal tokens. Not too difficult to have two or three different creatures in play to draw cards with. But, you know, every now and then there's the fail case of the opponent killing all your creatures and then Golden Ratio doesn't do anything. So, on average, probably still a C+, but it's going to have pretty high upside if it works out and then uh, kind of is outweighed by the fail case where it doesn't do anything. Next up, another Planeswalker with Kazmina, Enigma Sage. Three mana starts out at two loyalty and has a passive ability saying each other Planeswalker we control has the loyalty abilities of Kazmina. So not super relevant for limited. Then the plus two lets us scry one and the minus X creates a zero zero fractal token with X plus one plus one counters on it. And then the minus eight ultimate lets us search our library for an instant or sorcery card that shares a color with this Planeswalker. We exile that card and then cast it for free. Kazmina's probably gonna be using the plus two at first, and then maybe in the turn after we can already make, let's say, a 3-3 three, three fractal token, and then we can start plussing again. So that's probably the play pattern you're gonna see most often. And overall, assuming we can protect Kazmina for a couple turns and get our value, it seems pretty strong. So having a two drop in play by the time we play Kazmina is gonna be pretty important, otherwise the opponent can easily take her out without us ever getting to make a fractal token. Yeah, let's go with a B actually. It might be a bit much. Manifestation Sage, 4 mana for a 2-2 human wizard, saying when Manifestation Sage enters a battlefield, create a 0-0 green and blue fractal creature token, put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is the number of cards in our hand. So, on average, if we cast Manifestation Sage, how many cards can we expect to have in hand? Maybe like 3 or 4. So overall, we definitely get our mana's worth in terms of power and toughness. And as we've seen, there's definitely a few synergies with those fractal tokens. So yeah, there's a lot to like about Manifestation Sage. And uh, even the fail case isn't too disastrous. So I like a B for Manifestation Sage. Then a Needlethorn Drake, two mana for a 1-1 one, one, Drake with Flying and Death Touch. So can chip in early, get in a few points of damage, and then also nice defensive creature that can trade for pretty much anything the opponent has in play, and uh, maybe forces them to use a removal spell to get rid of it instead. So yeah, this buys us a lot of time if our plan is to ramp into big stuff, and uh, I'm happy giving Needle to Thorn Drake a C+, just a nice little creature that's quite versatile. 
Then Quandrix Apprentice, part of the Apprentice cycle, but this is probably one of the more impressive apprentices we've seen so far. And the Magecraft ability lets us take a look at the top three cards of our library, reveal a land card from among them and put it into our hand, and the rest goes on the bottom, stabled onto a 2-2 creature. So this seems perfect for what Quandrix is all about, which is hitting its land drops and ramping to get eventually eight lands in play. And uh, yeah, essentially drawing an extra card with each Magecraft trigger, so it provides a ton of advantage. So I like a B for Quandrix Apprentice, seems like the best apprentice so far. Then we get our command, Quandrix command, 3 mana, instant at rare, choose 2 between return a target creature or planeswalker to Sonar's hand, counter target artifact or enchantment spell. There's not too many artifacts or enchantments in the set, but the few artifacts and enchantments are typically at higher rarity and they can be quite powerful, so countering those is quite nice. Then put two plus one plus one counters on target creature, or target player shuffles up to three target cards from their graveyard into their library, so it can potentially stop some graveyard recursion. So overall the modes we're going to use most often are probably the two plus one plus one counters, and then bouncing a creature, which as we mentioned, very effective against any potential fractal tokens from the opponent. So Quandrix Command is uh, quite nice and flexible overall, give this a B as well. Then we have Quandrix Cultivator for mana for a 3-4 Turtle Druid at Uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, we may search or library for a basic forest or island card and put it on the battlefield. So a 3-4 for 4, 4 that ramps, so this card seems amazing, perfect for what Quandrix is trying to do, and also potentially splashable. If we have double blue and just a single green, we can potentially splash this in a uh, Prismari deck that's also interested in ramping. So I think both the Prismari and Quandrix colleges will combine nicely together since they're both interested in developing their mana and then spending mana on expensive spells or just having a lot of lands in play. So I like a B for Quandrix Cultivator, pretty high B. If I were giving B pluses, this would get a B plus. Then Quandrix Plunge Mage, 3 mana for a 2-2 Merfolk Druid at common with Magecraft, putting a plus one plus one counter on it. So a nice lasting Magecraft ability, unlike some of the other ones that are just temporary. So yeah, Pledge Mage seems quite good, one of the better Pledge Mages we've seen so far, and gets a C plus from me. Then Square Up. One and a blue-green hybrid for a two-mana instance, saying a target creature has base, power, and toughness 4-4 four, four until end of turn. So the only thing I really have to say about Square Up is that it synergizes nicely with Fractals, because they have base power 0-0 zero, zero with a bunch of plus one counters on it. So if you cast Square Up, they turn into 4-4s four, plus whatever plus one counters they have. So they potentially become quite a bit larger. Uh, overall, this is not a very high value cards, it's kind of an awkward comma trick that doesn't always line up or do what you want it to do. So I'm giving this a D. And then we get to our Elder Dragon for the Quandrix. Tanazir Quandrix is a 5 mana for 4 Elder Dragon with Flying and Trample. And when Tanazir enters a battlefield, double the number of plus one plus one counters on target creature you control. Now we're not necessarily always going to have a Fractal token in play, but, you know, even if we ignore this ability, there's still more going on here, because when Tanazar attacks, we may have the base, power, and toughness of other creatures we control become equal to Tanazar Quandrix's power and toughness until end of turn. What I mentioned about Square Up also applies to Tanazir. If we have a bunch of fractals in play, they will become potentially 4-4s four plus whatever counters they have, and then usually your creatures are going to be smaller than 4-4s, four so Tanazir has a pretty big impact when he attacks. And then, uh, yeah, 5 mana 4-4 four, four Flying Trample by itself is already pretty decent. So this card seems quite good, and also gets an A from me. Next up we have Zimon, Quandrix Prodigy. 2 mana for a 1-2 Legendary Human Wizard at Uncommon. And for 1 mana we can tap Zimon and put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield tapped. So potentially helps us ramp. And then for 4 mana we can tap and draw a card, and if we control 8 or more lands we get to draw 2 cards instead. So this card is slow, a 1-2 isn't, you know, an impressive board presence, 
but if unanswered, this can single-handedly take over a stalled game. So there's a lot to like about Zimon, and uh, the flexibility of potentially ramping us early is a nice add bonus. So if we've got a lot of card draw, uh, we can also kind of complement it with putting extra lands in play to potentially draw even more cards. So I like a B for Zimon. And that's all of Quandrix. So what have we learned? Quandrix cares about fractal tokens. It cares about plus one counters to an extent, and it cares about ramping up to eight lands in play to power up some of its cards. All right, now it's time to take a look at Silver Quill, which is black-white. Although I'm uh, looking at a black-red card here, which is a little strange. Awaken, the Blood Avatar, is the back half of Axtus, Auric Overlord, a 4-mana 2-4 Legendary Human Warlock at Mythic. It has Double Strike, and Magecraft says return target a non-legendary creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So an incredibly powerful Magecraft ability that, if unanswered, will definitely take over a grindy game. And then besides the 2-4 Double Strike, which is quite strong, we can potentially cast Awaken the Blood Avatar, which is an 8-mana sorcery in black-red. And as an additional cost to cast this, we may sacrifice any number of creatures, and the spell costs 2 generic mana less to cast for each creature sacrificed this way. And then each opponent sacrifices a creature, we get to make a 3-6 black and red avatar creature token with haste, and has the ability whenever this creature attacks it deals 3 damage to each opponent. So that's a lot to take in. Now this card is going to be at its best if it's splashed in a black-green deck, which as we'll see has a lot of, you know, random tokens it can sacrifice. Although you could potentially splash this in black-white as well if you wanted to. And then of course the 2-4 uh, double strike is the card you're most interested in, but every now and then you might cast Awaken the Blood Avatar. But even ignoring Awaken the Blood Avatar, just, you know, this Exodus by himself is uh, incredibly powerful, so it doesn't need any more help. So the 8 mana sorceries just added upside. And yeah, Exodus is amazing, easily gets an A, just a very strong card by itself that can provide a lot of card advantage. Then we've got another dual face card with Selfless, a Glyph Weaver, 2 and a white for a 2-3 Human Cleric at rare. We can exile the Glyph Weaver and then creatures we control gain indestructible until end of turn. So this is already a pretty nice effect. It's not very often that, you know, more than one creature would die and we can save it with a Glyph Weaver. So it's not too different from just a single creature getting indestructible. But especially when you're playing defense, making your entire team indestructible is going to make it very difficult for the opponent to set up any profitable attacks. Especially ones that involve many creatures attacking at the same time. So, you know, fine creature. And then we also have Deadly Vanity, an 8 mana sorcery saying choose a creature or planeswalker and then destroy all other creatures and planeswalkers. So this is, you know, game winning if you get to cast it. We get to save our biggest creature and the opponent loses their entire board. Of course getting to 8 mana is going to be a bit of a challenge, especially in black-white, which isn't really set up to ramp all that well compared to maybe blue-green or blue-red. So we're mostly looking at the creature half with every now and then having the upside of casting Deadly Vanity for 8 mana. So overall this card's still, you know, quite good and easily gets a B from me, but I wouldn't overrate it just because getting to cast the 8 mana sorcery is not going to happen very frequently. Then we have a, another dual faced rare here, and it's Shale, Dean of Radiance, a 2 mana 1 1 legendary bird cleric with vigilance and flying, and can tap to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature that entered the battlefield under our control this turn. So, just this effect by itself is very strong since we can play this on turn 2, and then pretty much every turn afterwards we can put a plus 1 counter on our creatures. So, even if they kill Shale, we still had some long lasting value from this card and uh, there's not that many cheap removal spells to easily take care of this. And then we also have the flexibility once again to play Ambrose, Dean of Shadow, 4 mana, 4-4, four, four, Human Warlock, and can tap to put a plus one plus one counter on another target creature, and then Ambrose deals 2 damage to that creature. So 
makes uh, one of our creatures suffer before giving it a tiny reward in the form of a plus one plus one counter. And we also get a 4-4 creature, which is decently standard, so can also attack and block pretty well. And then whenever a creature we control with a plus one plus one counter on it dies, we get to draw a card. So if we have any other creatures with plus one counters, then uh, this can provide some incidental value. And you can also potentially, if you have a 1-1 one -one token, use the ability to put a counter on it, deal 2 damage to it, it dies, so we get to draw a card. So there's potentially that synergy as well. So both halves of this card are quite good, and uh, it's gonna kind of depend how your curve looks like, and when you draw the card, if you draw it early, probably want to play the 2-drop, and then late game you can still get a ton of value and plus 1 counters with Ambrose. So the entire package is great here, and I'm happy giving this an A. Then we've got Blot Out the Sky, X, a white, and a black for a mythic rare sorcery, creating X, tapped, 2, 1, white, and black, inkling a creature tokens with flying. So those are the typical tokens in black-white. In red-white we had the 3-2 spirits, in blue-red we had the 4-4 four, four elementals, in blue-green we had the fractal tokens, and then if X is 6 or more, destroy all non-creature, non-land permanents. Yeah, this is very powerful. Pretty good at any point in your curve. If you cast this for x equals 1, we're essentially spending 3 mana for a 2-1 flyer, which is, you know, not exciting, but definitely fine. But then if x is anything more than 1, it gets even better. And uh, being able to destroy non-creature, non-land permanents can also come up. So that's just an uh, added bonus for the most part. So, yeah, Blood Out the Sky, maybe not quite an s grade. It's easy to compare this to Starnheim Unleashed, but there's still a difference between a 2-1 flyer and a 4-4 flyer. So I think I'm hesitant to give this an S, although it's definitely at least an A+, plus if we were handing out pluses. Then we've got Closing Statement, a 5-mana instant, add uncommon, costs 2 generic mana, less to cast during our end step. And then we can destroy a creature or planeswalker we don't control and put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature we control. Black-white, as we'll notice, has a lot of plus-one counter synergies throughout, so seems like a, a nice added bonus here on an already pretty powerful card, especially if we make use of the mana discount, three mana, for a nice efficient removal spell. And there's even some cool synergies that we'll get to later with closing statement. So overall, there's a lot to like about this, so it gets at least a B, which is usually my grade for efficient removal spells. Then we have a Dramatic Finale, 4 black-white hybrid mana for a rare enchantment, saying a creature tokens we control get plus 1 plus 1, so plays nicely alongside those Inkling tokens. And we in fact get to make some Inkling tokens potentially, because whenever one or more non-token creatures we control die, create a 2-1 white and black Inkling creature token with flying, and this ability triggers only once each turn. Not every deck necessarily has access to a ton of uh, tokens, but assuming you can use the finale itself to trigger the ability to make some 2-1s, you'll be able to make a pretty nice army of 3-2 tokens, which is a pretty big difference between 2-1 uh, tokens. So this seems great, and uh, doesn't require too much work to get this going, and uh, of course the more tokens the better, so this gets an A from me. Bit of a build around, but still going to be good in your average black-white deck. Then we have Exhilarating Elocution, 4 mana for a sorcery at common, putting 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on target creature you control, and other creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So this is a sorcery, so it's not going to catch the opponent off guard, but we mentioned that black-white does have a few plus 1 counter synergies, so this can potentially enable those. That being said, I'm not super high on Exhilarating Elocution, it might be a role player in the very aggressive black-white decks where you're very low curve and you just want to apply as much pressure as possible, in which case I could see you know, this being a, a nice role player, but that's not necessarily every black-white deck, so I'm gonna stay conservative and give this a C. Then we have a Fracture, surprise the name hasn't been taken yet, black-white for an instant and uncommon destroying target artifact, enchantment or planeswalker. So probably still just a sideboard card. We mentioned that there's not too many artifacts or enchantments in the set, so 
I'm probably never gonna main deck Fracture, but a nice sideboard card to have access to. Gets a D. Humiliates is a black and a white for a sorcery at uncommon. It's a nice discard effect, letting us take a look at the opponent's hand, choose a non-land card from it, player discards that card, and we also get to put a plus one plus one counter on a creature we control. So reminds me of Thought Erasure in Ravnica. This forgoes the surveil for a plus one plus one counter. Of course, if we want to cast this on turn two, it would be nice if we had a one drop in play that can pick up that plus one counter right away so it doesn't go to waste, but otherwise we can still just cast this in a later turn after deploying a few additional creatures. So yeah, a nice discard effect and gets a C plus, gonna be a nice card in pretty much any black white deck. Then we have another summoning, Inkling Summoning is a three mana sorcery, so another lesson, creating a 2-1 white and black Inkling creature token with flying. So as I've given pretty much all the other lessons, I'm going to give this a B as well, just because those lessons are pretty valuable if you can pick up some of the cards that let you search them up. Then we have Killian, Ink Duelist, black and white for a 2-2 legendary human warlock with lifelink and menace, and those two especially combine nicely since a difficult to block creature that also has lifelink also now becomes difficult to race. And spells you cast that target a creature cost 2 generic mana less to cast. So now all of a sudden that uh, exhilarating elocution looks a lot better if we can cast it for just 2 mana instead of 4. So those are potential synergies to watch out for. But yeah, Killian looks great and uh, happy giving this a B enables a lot of synergies, but is also just a powerful card by itself without any additional work. Then we have Owlin, Shield Mage, 5 mana for a 3-3 Bird Warlock at common. It flies and has Ward. This time instead of having to pay extra mana, the opponent has to pay 3 life if they want to target this with a spell or ability. So a 3-3 Flyer for 5 may be slightly overcosted by 1 mana, but we do get that Ward ability in return. So seems like a, a fine card. Maybe not quite a C+, but... It definitely gets close, so I'm gonna start with a C for the Shield Mage. Uh, fine card, but uh, I could see this being a nice role player for the Black White decks, of course. And then we have Rise of Extus, six mana for a sorcery at common, and it's Black White hybrid, so it can easily be played in a different deck as well. Let's us exile target creature and then exile up to one target instant or sorcery card from a graveyard can potentially enable some of the lore hold synergies or disrupt opposing lore hold synergies and then we get to learn so i think this is our first instance of the learn mechanic so we may reveal a lesson card we own from outside the game and put it into our hand or discard a card and then draw a card so more often than not we're going to be interested in searching up a sideboard card so that's why picking up those Lessons is so important and why I gave them such high grades so far and Then you know if you don't have any sideboard cards or if you looked them up already with another learn card You still have the ability to discard a card and draw a card So you still get a little bit of extra value lessons are gonna start in a sideboard you get to search them up by learning and uh, Yeah, that makes rise of Extus a very powerful card since we get a removal spell and essentially get to tutor for one of our sideboard cards at the same time. So this card seems quite good, happy giving this a B, even though it's a little pricey at 6 mana. Then we have Shadewing Laureate, 3 mana for a 2-2 human warlock at uncommon, it flies, and whenever another creature we control with flying dies, we can put a plus one plus one counter on target creature we control. So 3 mana 2-2 flyers, you know, fine, we've grown used to these by now, but this has a bit of added upside of uh, potentially distributing some plus one plus one counters. Black-white, definitely the color that cares about flyers the most, especially with those inkling tokens. So Laureate seems pretty good, C+. Then we've got our Elder Dragon, Shadrix, Silver Quill, 5 mana for a 2-5, flying double striking dragon, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may choose two and each mode must target a different player. So if we choose to enable this, we have to target the opponent with at least one of them. And then the abilities are target player creates a 2-1 white and black inkling creature token with flying, 
target player draws a card and loses one life, and target player puts a plus one plus one counter on each creature they control. It's going to be very interesting to decide which ones to choose for the opponent whenever you attack. But at the end of the day, this card is quite strong. 2-5 flying double strike can close out a game pretty quickly, especially if you start putting plus one counters on it and can potentially be joined by an army of inkling tokens while damaging the opponents if we, you know, decide to let them have extra cards at the cost of one life. So a lot of interesting decisions with this card, and it's not going to be straightforward, but overall the power level's quite high, and I'm happy giving this an A. Then we have our Apprentice in black-white. Silver Quill Apprentice is a 2-2 human warlock at Uncommon with Magecraft, giving target creature plus one plus so until end of turn. So we can choose any target creature, making this a little bit more flexible than some of the other Magecraft bonuses we've seen, but still not incredibly exciting at the end of the day, so probably falls in uh, C+, plus, maybe slightly better than, let's say, the Lorehold Apprentice, which I wasn't too thrilled by, but still not as good as, let's say, the Quandrix one that can potentially provide card advantage. And then we have our Silver Quill Command, 4 mana sorcery at rare, lets us choose two between a target creature gets plus 3 plus 3 and flying until end of turn. We can return target creature card with mana value 2 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield, target player draws a card and loses one life, and target opponent sacrifices a creature. So none of these by themselves are super exciting, but if you get to choose two of them, we get to a pretty nice card overall. Now this is a sorcery, so the plus three comma trick is not going to catch the opponent off guard, but it is a nice way to potentially jump one of our creatures to get in those final points of damage, and can maybe even combine it with the card draw effect and target the opponent with it to make them lose one additional life. But uh, yeah, I could see using pretty much any of these abilities at any point. If we're going for the value play, we can draw a card, lose one life, maybe return a creature, or make the opponent sacrifice a creature if they don't have any small tokens in play. So overall, Silver Quill Command gets a B as well. Then we've got Silver Quill Pledge Mage, 3 mana including double black-white hybrid for a 3-1 Vampire Cleric at common with Magecraft, giving it our choice of flying or lifelink until end of turn. So the flying especially is going to be useful here, giving us an evasive three-powered creature can hit pretty hard. And we've seen a couple of flying synergies already. And then, of course, if the opponent doesn't have any good blocks, we can always choose lifelink to make it more difficult for the opponent to race. But I expect flying to be used more often than not. So yeah, Pledge Mage seems pretty solid. So uh, as long as we can enable it consistently, a 3-mana, three 3 powered flyer is incredibly powerful, so C plus overall for Silver Quill Pledge Mage. Then we've got Silver Quill Silencer, 2 mana for a 3-2 Human Cleric at rare. And when a Silencer enters battlefield, we get to choose a non-land card name. And whenever an opponent casts a spell with a chosen name, they lose 3 life and we get to draw a card. Now of course in Limited, Unless we have access to the discard effect, which we saw earlier, we're probably not going to have any great information on what the opponent's holding, unless we're playing sideboarded games and got to see some of the opponent's cards in game one. So at best we can make an educated guess and just name a common or uncommon that they're likely to have in their deck. You know, it's unlikely that we get to trigger the ability, but it could come up, and this is where your knowledge of the set is going to come in handy. But at the end of the day, it's still 2 mana for a 3-2, which isn't too bad. So probably just a C plus for Silver Quill Silencer, wouldn't rate it too highly, but could potentially have some fun constructed applications as well. I guess one thing to mention about Silver Quill Silencer, if the opponent is playing with any of the lesson cards, of course they do have to reveal them when they put them in their hand. So if they learn, grab a sideboard card, then the Silencer can potentially swoop in and name whatever the opponent searched up. So that's maybe another interaction worth pointing out that makes this a little bit better. Then we've got Spiteful Squad, 4 mana for a 0, zero human warlock with death touch, enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it, and when the squad dies, it puts its counters on a target creature we control. 2-2 two, two death touch that can easily trade 
and then give another one of our creatures plus two plus two essentially seems pretty strong doesn't you know hit incredibly hard by itself so the opponent can just take two damage over and over but especially on defense this is going to be pretty difficult for the opponent to get past without giving you a bit of value so i like spiteful squad give this a c plus Vanishing Verse is a 2 mana instant at rare, exiling target monocolored permanent. So, in you know a regular set, this would be a very efficient removal spell that takes care of pretty much any problem. Now, we are kind of in a multicolor set, so the most powerful cards are typically going to be multicolor, which Vanishing Verse doesn't deal with, but there's still plenty of powerful monocolored cards, as we'll see. And it's still a very, you know, efficient removal spell. So don't know if I'm quite willing to give this a B, just because it misses on so many powerful cards in the set. But at the very least, a C plus, and still a card I'm, of course, happy to have in any black-white deck. And that's all of Silver Quill. So what did we learn about Silver Quill? It's a deck that cares about plus one plus one counters. It has a bit of flying synergy with Inkling tokens. Overall, seems like. A color that's poised to potentially make some nice aggressive decks, especially backed by those plus one plus one counter synergies. All right, time for Wither Bloom. Our first card here is a Black's Vexing Pest, dual faced card. It's a three mana, three two, legendary pest at Mythic Rare, saying author pests, bats, insects, snakes, and spiders you control get plus one plus one. So nice lord for all the you know, rejected creatures, and when Blacks dies, you gain for life. So, you know, pretty nicely standard creature. There's not too many of the bats, insects, snakes, and spiders in the set, but as we'll see in Wither Bloom, there's a lot of pests, so getting plus one plus one for those is quite relevant. And then we also get to potentially cast Search for Blacks, a four mana mythic rare sorcery. That lets us take a look at the top five cards of our library. We may put any number of them into our hand and the rest into our graveyard, but we lose three life for each card we put into our hand this way. So this could potentially be four mana, draw five cards, lose 15 life, which, you know, every now and then might be the correct play, although I doubt it's going to be very often. But we have the flexibility of drawing any number and losing any amount of life we want. And can also fill the graveyard, and as we'll see, there's quite a bit of graveyard recursion happening in Blank Green as well. So, again, we're just uh, making use of a nice flexible card, and uh, every now and then we'll prefer the creature half, every now and then we want a card advantage. So overall, pretty great card. Happy giving this at least a B. Would probably be a B plus if we were handing out B pluses. Pestilent Cauldron another dual faced card this is a three mana artifact at rare and it can tap and discard a card to make a one one black and green pest creature token that when it dies it gains one life so that's the typical token we'll see for wither bloom and then we can also pay one mana tap cauldron each opponent mills cards equal to the amount of life we gained this turn so it can potentially synergize with those pest tokens and for four mana we can tap Cauldron and exile four target cards from a single graveyard to draw a card. So if we manage to fill our graveyard this can potentially provide a bit of card advantage. Overall this is probably a nice late game artifact to turn lands into 1-1 one -one tokens. And uh, who knows, can potentially turn into a win condition by milling the opponents or can generate a bit of card advantage. Not too thrilled about the Pestilent Cauldron overall. But let's take a look at the other side here. Restorative Burst is a 5 mana sorcery, which can return up to 2 target creature, land and or planeswalker cards from our graveyard to our hand, and each player gains for life. Each player gains for life is pretty useful after we've just gained a ton of card advantage by returning a bunch of stuff from our graveyard, so we don't really mind that the opponent also gains for life, since we're looking to play a long, grindy game. So... Yeah, the flexibility here is nice. If we draw this in the late game, we're probably going to be more interested in getting some stuff back, unless we've got a ton of lands to discard to turn into 1-1 one -one tokens. So overall, maybe not the most impressive card, but again, there's a lot of flexibility here, so happy to give this at least a B. 
Then we have another dual faced card, Valentin, Dean of the Vein, is a 1 mana 1 1 legendary vampire warlock at rare with menace and lifelink. And if a non token creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead, and then we can pay 2 mana. If we do, we get to make a 1 1 black and green pest token that uh, again dies and potentially gives 1 life. Not the most impressive card, but can potentially generate a nice bit of. Uh, advantage making those pass tokens which we can then maybe sacrifice to various effects but the card we're more interested in is Lizette, Dean of the Root for mana for a 4-4 legendary human druid saying whenever we gain life we may pay one mana and if we do put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control and those creatures gain trample until end of turn. So this effect is uh, very impactful not too difficult to gain life between all those pest tokens and a plus one counter on each creature you control plus trample doesn't mess around. Yeah, Lizette is probably the card we're most interested in, but every now and then we might cast uh, one drop as well. So this card seems great, and happy giving this an A, assuming we can gain some life. Then we have Belladros Witherbloom, 7 mana for our 4-4 four, four legendary Elder Dragon at Mythic. It flies. And at the beginning of each upkeep, so that also includes the opponent's upkeep, much like Koma in Kaltheim, we get to make a 1 1 pest token. And then we can also pay 10 life at any point to untap all lands we control. Can only activate once each turn. So maybe we'll use that every now and then to cast a very expensive spell or to help us empty our hands. But unless we've got a lot of life gain from those uh, pest tokens first. We're probably not going to double our mana too often, but it's just nice to have that ability. And yeah, it doesn't take very long for Belladros to fill the board with pest tokens, making it pretty much impossible for the opponent to kill us on the ground. So they need to either answer Belladros or have a lot of big flyers to try and race us. So yeah, another A-level Elder Dragon here. They've all been very good, but not necessarily game-breaking. So if you do have a good removal spell at the ready, you can usually answer them without too many repercussions. Then we have a Blood Researcher, 3 mana for a 2-2 Vampire Druid at common, it has Menace, and whenever we gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on Blood Researcher. Nice common, can get in some evasive damage, grow over time, plays well with the pest tokens, so C plus for Blood Researcher, although it's funny that C plus is not really a blood type. Then Cram Session, one and a black green hybrid for a sorcery at common. We get to gain four life and we get to learn. So this is one of those many learn cards in the set that uh, are probably going to play out better than they might look at first glance, just because the flexibility of grabbing any of our sideboard cards that we potentially drafted, all those lessons, is uh, very valuable. And there's quite a few synergistic cards in uh, Wither Bloom that we can potentially grab, as we'll see in a second with the summoning. So yeah, Cram Session seems pretty good, C+, and also easily played in a black-white deck or a blue-green deck that doesn't necessarily care too much about the life gain and just uses it as pure upside. Then we have Culling Ritual to a black and a green for a rare sorcery, destroying each non-land permanent with mana value 2 or less, and we get to add black or green for each permanent destroyed this way. So a sweeper for small stuff, although I do want to once again point out that of course the set does have those big fractal tokens and just tokens in general. So those 4-4 four, four elemental tokens, the 3-2 spirits, all the inkling tokens, those also die to calling ritual. So it does kill more stuff than you might expect at first glance, making this a bit better than it looks, and then Getting a bit of mana on top of that can also be useful. So yeah, I like C plus for Culling Ritual. Would uh, probably not be that high in a regular set without that many tokens. Then we have a Demogoth Titan for black and green hybrid for an 11-10 demon at rare. But there's got to be a downside, and in this case when the Titan attacks or blocks, sacrifice a creature. So we need to keep fueling the titan with 1-1 uh, pest tokens, for instance, and uh, then we might be okay. Definitely disincentivizes the opponent to attack into it if we've got some random sacrifice fodder we can get rid of. So 
you know, plays defense quite well, and as we'll see, potentially enables some pretty spicy synergies as well. Definitely a build around card, but can easily carry its weight if you can enable it. So I'll start out with a C plus for Titan, but in the right deck it can easily go much higher. Then we have Demogoth Woe Eater, 4 mana for a 7-6 demon and uncommon. And at the beginning of our upkeep we have to sacrifice a creature, so this one kind of keeps going even if we don't attack or block with it, so don't really get to control when we sacrifice as much as a previous card. But when we sacrifice the Woe Eater, each opponent discards a card, we draw a card, and we gain two life. So we, you know, usually get our value back right away. Playable card, uh, better if we can build around it. So I'm probably gonna land on a C plus for this one as well. Then we have a Deadly Brew, two mana for a Sorcery at Uncommon, saying each player sacrifices a creature or planeswalker. If we sacrifice a permanent this way, we may return another permanent card from our graveyard to our hand. So edict effects typically aren't amazing in limited, since there's usually some random creature the opponent doesn't care about that they can sacrifice. In this case, it does potentially play well with those pest tokens, which we often don't mind sacrificing. So if we manage to sacrifice a token, opponent has to sacrifice hopefully a real creature, and we get to return something from the graveyard to our hand. So that can be a nice value card. Overall still not super high on Deadly Brew, since there will be situations where we actively don't want to sacrifice anything, and then it's a pretty bad edict effect, so overall C for Deadly Brew, but uh, can potentially be quite nice in the right deck. Then we have Dina, Soul Steeper. This is our two mana uncommon legendary creature. This is a Dryad Druid, a 1-3, saying whenever we gain life, each opponent loses one life. This is reminiscent of Veto, with the caveat that it's at most one life that the opponent loses instead of losing as much life as we gained. So at its best if we gain life in small increments, so if we sacrifice those pass tokens for instance. And then for one mana we can sacrifice another creature, and Dina gets plus X plus O until end of turn where X is the sacrifice creature's power. So this is potentially one way to synergize with those two uh, large creatures we saw earlier. We can attack with Dina and just a threat of activation of Dina getting 7 or 11 additional power out of nowhere means that the opponent might face some pretty awkward blocks. So overall, Dina a bit of a build around card, but uh, the payoff is definitely there. So C plus for Soul Steeper. Then we have Harness Infinity, 7 mana for a mythic rare instant saying exchange your hand and graveyard and then exile Harness Infinity. Now the fact that this is an instant makes it, you know, a little bit better than it would be otherwise, since we can potentially cast this in our upkeep, that way we still get to draw a card without having to discard it, or we can cast it end of turn, so we can potentially start out with all our mana untapped. Seven mana is expensive, it's not going to be great at the start of the game, but if you can pull it off, uh, it can easily win you the game, so a B seems appropriate here for Harness Infinity. Then we have Infuse with Vitality, 2 mana instant at common, saying until end of turn, target creature gains death touch, and when this creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control, and we also gain 2 life. So a nice little way to potentially trade one of our smaller creatures for something larger, of course, if we use this with a token, it's not going to come back, because uh, once they leave the battlefield, they kind of cease to exist. So could use it with a pest to trade our 1-1 for something real, but definitely at its best when we're actually targeting a real creature. And then, uh, you know, can be used to save a creature from removal or to trade in, in the middle of combat, and has a bit of a life gain stapled onto it, which is always nice. Not an incredibly high pick, but definitely playable. So C for Infuse with Vitality. Then we have Moldering Karok, 4 mana for a 3-3 Zombie Crocodile with a Trample and Lifelink. So, you know, decent stats, and uh, definitely a nice upgrade over your typical 4 mana 3-3s with uh, some nice keywords, plays well with any plus one counters we can place on it as well, and makes it difficult for the opponent to race. 
So I like C plus for moldering Karok. Then we have Mortality Spear, 4 mana for an instant add on common, saying destroy target a non-land permanent. That would already be a B. And then this costs 2 less to cast if we gain life this turn. So it has some added upside of uh, discounting it if we gain life. Still going to be a B. If we were handing out B pluses, this would be probably a B plus. Just a very efficient removal spell that deals with any problem you may come across. Then we get to our summoning for Wither Bloom Pest Summoning. 3 mana for a sorcery lesson, creating 2 1 1 black and green pest tokens that gain 1 life when they die. So, yeah, perfect card to search up after potentially casting a turn 2 cram session. And then turn 3, we get to pest summoning, make 2 1 1s. We've got some sacrifice effects that synergize with it, life gain synergies. So. A lot better than it may look at first glance. Of course, not a card you're happy to necessarily main deck, but perfect to put in your sideboard and then grab after you learn. Although, could also potentially be playable still if you don't have any learn cards whatsoever. So that's a B for pass summoning. Then Rushed Rebirth, 2 mana for an instant at rare, saying choose target creature when that creature dies at this turn. Search your library for a creature card with a lesser mana value and put it on the battlefield tapped. So you could potentially use this on the opponent's creature as well and then kill it, but that's uh, not a sequence that's easy to set up. Overall, not the biggest fan of Rushed Rebirth, kind of conditional in nature, difficult to set up, and the uh, final payoff isn't necessarily all that great. So I'm giving this a D. And then at Tent, the Pests, 2 mana for an instant, add on common, and as an additional cost to cast it, sacrifice a creature, and then create X, 1-1 one, one Pest tokens, where X is the sacrifice creature's power. So this is another great card to synergize with those 11, 10, and 7, 6 creatures that we saw earlier. Now, in an average deck where you don't have those, it's not that exciting. You know, opponent maybe tries to kill one of our creatures, we sacrifice it and make some pests in response, that's probably the best case scenario. On average, still not super exciting. So I'm starting this as a D, but it's definitely a build around. So if your deck does have some of those very large creatures, then, uh, you know, sacrificing your 11-10 to make 11-1-1 uh, tokens is probably going to win you the game. So then 10 the pests will go up in value dramatically. So definitely build around card and it will fluctuate depending on the rest of your deck. Then we have Wither Bloom Apprentice, 2 mana for a 2 2 human druid add on common, with Magecraft saying each opponent loses one life and we gain one life. A little bit of incremental life gain and damage never hurts. Nice to have it on a 2 2 creature, so fine playable card, uh, nothing wrong with it. C plus for Wither Bloom Apprentice. Then we have Wither Bloom Command, 2 mana for a sorcery at rare letting us choose two between target player mills three cards, then we return a land card from our graveyard to our hand, destroy target non-creature non-land permanent with mana value two or less, target creature gets minus three minus one until end of turn, and finally target opponent loses two life and we gain two life. So the abilities we're going to use most often are probably going to be the top three modes, especially the middle ones of uh, destroying something and giving minus three minus one. Now this is a sorcery so we can't really use it as a combo trick, but still potentially a way to kill one toughness creatures or finish off a creature that took a bit of damage. Even later in the game it's usually not too difficult to get a value out of this, so I like a B for Wither Bloom command. Then we've got Wither Bloom Pledge Mage, 5 mana for a 5-5 Tree Folk Warlock at common, with Magecraft gaining one life. So a more incidental life gain for potential life gain synergies. And a 5 mana 5-5, five five, as we've uh, learned in Kaldheim, is often better than it looks, depending on how the removal spells in the set look like. So this seems like a totally fine card. Happy giving this a C+. And that's all of Wither Bloom taken care of. So Wither Bloom cares about life gain synergies, sacrifice synergies, pass tokens, and uh, that's kind of what it's all about. Filling the graveyard, getting stuff back out of the graveyard. So now we have that info going into the rest of our set review. Time to start out with all the different colors, starting with white. 
And our first card is Academic Probation, 2 mana for a Sorcery, Lesson, at a Rare. So not a card we're going to main deck, but put in our sideboard. And we get to choose one between choose a non-land card name, opponents cannot cast spells with the chosen name until your next turn, probably not going to happen very often. Instead, choose target non-land permanent until your next turn, it cannot attack or block, and its activated abilities cannot be activated. So not a very impactful card, it's uh, pretty situational, but if the, you know, the situation lines up, you could easily prevent a large blocker from attacking or blocking, get in a good attack, and that can easily swing the game. It's always nice to have access to some of these more situational cards, since they can be pretty good if uh, the circumstances are right for it. So not a card you ever want to main deck, but a nice one to pick up for the sideboard. Overall, probably give this a C overall, maybe D, D+. Plus. Not a very high pick, but don't uh, undervalue the lesson cards. Then we have Ageless Guardian. 2 mana for a 1-4 Spirit Soldier. Spirit, as we know from Lorehold, is a relevant creature type. And a 1-4 plays defense well, so not a card you're necessarily going to want in the uh, Silver Quill aggressive decks, but potentially a card you want in the slower, grindy Lorehold decks that want to get value out of the graveyard. So overall, C for Agel's Guardian has a lot of stats for a 2-drop. Then we've got Beaming Defiance, two mana instant at common, giving target creature. We, we, two mana instant at common, giving target creature we control plus two plus two and hexproof until end of turn. So combo trick that can also double up as a way to save a creature from removal. Two mana is expensive. Usually, prefer one mana for this type of uh, combo trick. It's not super high on Beaming Defiance, but it's still playable. So C for Beaming Defiance. Going to be nice in the Silver Quill decks where you want to go all in on one creature and then try and protect it with our various combo tricks. Then Clever Lumimancer is a 1 mana 01 Human Wizard add on common with Magecraft giving it plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So in Lorehold, this doesn't seem great. In the Silver Quill decks that have a lot of instants and sorceries, maybe they've got a lot of cards with a learn mechanic and then lessons to follow up with. This might become playable if you can trigger it twice in one turn, turns up, turns it into a 4-5, can usually set up a nice attack with it, potentially plays well with instance as well. The average deck is not going to be able to trigger this consistently multiple times per turn, and then it doesn't do much for you, and even just bumping it once in the mid to late game is probably not going to get you any attacks in. So. Potentially card for constructed, but don't love it for limited, so I'm gonna give it a D. Then we have Combat Professor for mana 2 3 Bird Cleric at common, it flies, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, target creature we control gains plus 1 plus 0 and vigilance until end of turn. So can potentially target itself as well, turning it into a 3 3 flyer with vigilance, which is quite good for 4 mana. And it has even more upside since we can play it and the turn we play it already get the benefits from the plus one plus one and vigilance. So yeah, this card seems great. Easy C+. Plus. Defend the campus. Four mana instant at common, letting us choose one between giving our creatures plus one plus one until end of turn and destroying a creature with power four or greater. So smite a monstrous, as you may remember. Well, this card's, you know, pretty nice and flexible. Probably going to be at its best in the Silver Quill decks where you're going to use the plus one plus one to all your creatures every now and then. Uh, but the mode you're going to use most often is probably destroying creature with power four or greater. But having the flexibility of either one makes this even better. Overall, don't know if I'm quite willing to go to a C plus for this since you're probably only going to want one copy of this at most in your white decks. So probably lands on C for defend the campus, but you know, fine, flexible card for sure. Then the Tension Vortex is a 1 mana enchantment aura at uncommon, enchants a non-land permanent, and the enchanted permanent cannot attack or block, and its activated abilities cannot be activated. This card sounds pretty good until here, but then for 3 mana, destroy the Tension Vortex, and only your opponents may activate this ability and only at sorcery speed. Yeah, this card's pretty bad. Um, you can maybe make a case for this in a very aggressive Silver Quill deck where you don't care about card disadvantage and it's all about tempo and getting in damage. 
but uh, I'm not really buying it. So I'm going to give this a D at most, probably just an F. Devastating Mastery, 2 and 4 white mana for a rare sorcery. And uh, now the, the Mastery cycle, as we'll see, is a little bit wordy and difficult to parse, but you can kind of view it as a reverse kicker instead of a cheap spell that we can kick to have a bigger effect. It starts out as an expensive spell, but we have the flexibility of casting it for a cheaper cost and then get a reduced effect. A 6 mana sorcery essentially, and if we cast it for 6 mana we destroy all non-land permanents, but we can also play it for 4 mana, and if we play it for 4 mana then we choose an opponent which has to return two non-land permanents they control and put them back into their hand. The fact that the opponent has to pick up two of their creatures is more relevant in the set than it would be elsewhere because of all the creature tokens that are running around. So if the opponent has a large token and another random creature and we play this for four mana, besides the tempo advantage we also actually kill one of their tokens. So that sounds pretty good. And the flexibility of being able to cast this for four mana if we can't quite get to six means that if we're behind, we can still potentially buy some time by casting it for 4 mana. And then every now and then if we cast it for 6, we get our planar cleansing. And uh, that's going to be pretty backbreaking. So I think I like an A for Devastating Mastery. You know, it's not quite Wrath of God, but it gets kind of close because of the flexibility here. So still a pretty good card. Then Dueling Coach is a 4 mana 2 2 human monk and uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature, including potentially itself. And for 5 mana, we can tap it and put a plus 1 counter on each creature we control with a plus 1 counter on it. So, of course, going to be at its best if we have a lot of other creatures with counters on them. But even just with the one counter we start out with, it can potentially snowball if there's a bit of a board stall going on. So I like C plus for Dueling Coach, uh, kind of expensive but has upside in a longer game. Then Eager First Year, 2 mana 2-2 two, two with Magecraft, giving it plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. Nothing too exciting, but uh, you know, it's a filler card if we need a random 2-drop, probably just a D. Elite Spellbinder, 2 and a white for a Human Cleric at rare, it's a 3-1 flyer, and when Spellbinder enters the battlefield we can look at the opponent's hand, exile a non-land card from it, and for as long as that card remains exiled, the opponent can play it at an increased cost of 2 generic mana. So a 3-1 flyer for 3 is already quite good, and we get that additional disruption and information on top of it, so Elite Spellbinder seems quite good, at least worthy of a B, probably B+, plus if we were giving out B+. Pluses. Expel 2 and a white for an instant at common, exiling target tapped creature. So maybe a little bit pricier than we're used to, but it does Exile, which potentially has some synergies in uh, Lore Hold as well, you never know. Probably just to see. It's a bit conditional in nature, but going to be at its best in a more defensive Lore Hold deck as opposed to an aggressive Silver Quill deck. Then we have a Guiding Voice, a 1 mana sorcery at common, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a target creature, and we get to learn so assuming we have cards in the sideboard, of course this goes up in value as opposed to just a draw discard effect. And uh, yeah, plus one counters are especially relevant in Silver Quill, so there's potentially some synergy there. And uh, if you have some powerful cards in the sideboard to search up, especially the more cards we have, the more flexible the learn mechanic becomes. This seems pretty great, so I'm happy giving this a C+. We get a counter and a card of our choice. Leonin Lightscribe, 2 mana for a 2-2 cat cleric at rare, with Magecraft giving all creatures we control plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So as far as Magecraft triggers go, this one's very powerful, and especially pairs nicely with instants, since the opponent won't know how many times we can enable Magecraft at instant speed. So Lightscribe gets an A from me, plays nicely alongside any tokens as well. 
Mavinda, Students Advocate, 2 and a white for a 2-3 bird advisor. It's legendary, it's mythic rare. It flies, and for zero mana, this is a bit of a weird one, we may cast target instant or sorcery card from our graveyard this turn. But there's more, if that spell doesn't target a creature we control, it costs 8 generic mana more to cast this way, and then we have to exile that spell afterwards. So, costing 8 more mana usually means that uh, we're limited to casting spells that actually target our creatures. Now if you take a look at the list of cards that target creatures, there's not too many of them, but especially in green there's a couple fight effects, and as we saw uh, in black-white, there's a few cards that incidentally target our creatures, so those are kind of the synergies you gotta look for. And on top of that we get a 3 mana 2 3 flyer, which already isn't too bad. So yeah, overall a B for Mavinda, but can potentially go up in value if we can pick up a lot of synergies for it. Pilgrim of the Ages is a 3 mana 2 1 spirit at common, and when it enters a battlefield, can search our library for a basic planes card, reveal it, and put it into our hand. And for 6 mana, we can return Pilgrim from our graveyard to our hand. So, nice grindy card advantage engine. Uh, doesn't fix our mana, but it does help us hit our land drops, so a bit reminiscent of Skittering Surveyor in that sense. It's also a spirit, which is relevant in. Lorehold colors. So yeah, this card seems quite nice. Easily a C plus as a nice value card. Pillar Drop Rescuer, 5 mana for a 2-2 Spirit Cleric at common. It flies, and when the Rescuer enters a battlefield, return target creature card with mana value 3 or less from our graveyard to our hand. So a bit expensive at 5 mana, but we do get some good value. A 2-2 flyer, not irrelevant and uh, we get to return something from the graveyard, and it's also a spirit, so has those synergies going for it. So I wouldn't overrate the Rescuer, since it is pricey at 5 mana, but at the same time it's kind of a guarantee 2 for 1, so I like C+, at the same time for a Pillar Drop a Rescuer. Then a Professor of Symbology has a 2 mana 2-1 two Core Cleric at Uncommon, and when it enters the battlefield we get to learn so this is perfect, 2 mana 2-1, two, that essentially draws a card if you drafted enough lesson cards during the drafting portion. That card seems awesome, so easily give this a B, it's like an improved Elvish Visionary almost. Then Reduce to Memory is a 3 mana Sorcery Lesson at Uncommon, it's another card we're gonna start in the sideboard more often than not. Exiling target a non-land permanent, and its controller creates a 3-2 red and white spirit creature token. So we do have the flexibility of targeting our own creature and make a 3-2, but more often than not we're gonna exile a scary card from the opponent and turn it into a 3-2 instead, that we can hopefully manage a bit better. So as far as lesson cards go, this one's still quite valuable since it gives us access to removal, even if it's, you know, not the cleanest removal spell in existence, it's uh, still quite good. So, at least a C for reduced to memory. Then we have Secret Rendezvous, a 3 mana sorcery at uncommon, saying you and target opponent each draw 3 cards. That gets a, a straight F from me. Not many decks where I can imagine wanting this. Maybe like a very controlling slow deck, but uh, yeah, giving the opponent 3 cards and letting them untap with all those extra cards first is an incredibly big drawback. So very few circumstances where you would want this. Definitely made for multiplayer in mind. Then Semester's End is a 4 mana instant at rare, saying exile any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers you control. At the beginning of the next end step, return each of them to the battlefield under its owner's control, and each of them enters the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it, if it's a creature and an additional loyalty if it's a planeswalker. Could potentially line up nicely if the opponent has a sweeper effect, can, you know, save your team, give them plus one counters. That's definitely the best case scenario, that's rarely gonna line up. Keeping up four mana for this effect is quite pricey, so it's kind of clunky to keep up your mana to potentially save your creatures. So while, you know, all the text on this card can be impactful and at the very least could be sort of a four mana 
put a plus one counter on your team, except for, I guess, tokens, which don't really work well with exile effects. Uh, it's still a, a little clunky, so I'm not super high on semester's end. Probably just a C at most. Then a show of confidence is a two mana instant at uncommon. And when we cast it, we can copy it for each other instant and sorcery spell we've cast this turn and choose new targets for the copies. So that's basically storm, except for it only works with instants and sorceries. And then put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature, it gains a vigilance until end of turn. So difficult to cast more than one author instant or sorcery alongside it. So best case scenario, we're probably looking at two mana and then put two plus one plus one counters on two different creatures and give them vigilance. Eh, that's still not super exciting. And the fail case is just a single counter. If we want to make use of vigilance, we want to cast this before attacking. So then the opponent will know about it, which makes the instant speed part of the card less uh, exciting as well. So overall, I'm going to give Show of Confidence a D, but in the very synergistic Silver Quill decks where you have a lot of plus one counter synergy, you could maybe uh, consider it. Sparring Regimen, two and a white for an enchantment at rare. When it enters the battlefield, we get to learn. So that's already getting my attention. And then whenever we attack, put a plus one plus one counter on target attacking creature and we get to untap it. Powerful effect, especially combined with evasive creatures that can easily keep attacking. And then it's going to just keep on putting more counters on that same creature, requiring an answer. And at the same time, we already got our card back with a learn mechanic. So Sparring Regimen seems incredible and gets an A from me, assuming you've got some cards in the sideboard to search up. Then we've got uh, Star Pupil, single white for a 0-0 human wizard, enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it, and when it dies, we can put its counters on target creature we control. So this does synergize with other cards that have plus one counter synergy. That way when it dies, it gets to put all those counters somewhere else instead of just the one it started out with. It does probably play better than it looks, because, you know, 1 mana 1 one is not particularly playable these days. So it's definitely a highly synergy-driven card, and in the Silver Quill decks with a lot of plus one counter synergy that wants to curve out, maybe play turn one Star Pupil, turn two play the discard spell that puts a counter on it, then we can consider this in your average, more mid-rangey Silver Quill decks. I don't think we're going to want this. And in lore holds, I'm probably not going to play this uh, very often. So it probably makes this a D, but, you know, I could see a C- minus if we were handing out C- minuses instead. Stonebinder's Familiar, 1 mana for a 1-1 one, one Spirit Dog at Uncommon. And whenever one or more cards are put into Exile during your turn, put a plus one plus one counter on the Familiar, and it can only trigger once each turn. By itself, not an incredibly powerful card, but under the right circumstances, mainly in the uh, red-white Lorehold decks where you've got some cards you can exile automatically from the graveyard, then this can start picking up more plus one counters and uh, plays well with other exile effects like we saw earlier. The uh, three mana expel that exiles something can potentially grow this as well, so you know, over time the familiar is going to pick up some counters, assuming you're in the red-white colors. Still starts out pretty small, and if you top deck it late, it's not going to be very impactful. But then again, we might have some draw discard effects to get rid of it later, so... Uh, overall, give this a C, but uh, could overperform in a deck that has a lot of ways to trigger it. Stone Rise Spirit is one potential way to trigger it as a 2-mana 1-2 Spirit Bird with flying at common. And for 4 mana, we can exile a card from our graveyard, and then target creature gains flying until end of turn. So a 1-2 Spirit with flying already should get our attention if we're red-white, since that gives us access to an evasive creature that can potentially get additional power from our various uh, Anthem effects that we've seen. Of course, most of them are, are at higher rarity, so we're not guaranteed to get them, but at the very least it's something to think about. And then the ability for 4 mana not only exiles something to potentially enable some of the synergies, but also gives us access to a potentially very large evasive creature that can break any board stall and help us cross the finish line. So I like Stone Rise Spirit quite a bit. 
all those additional synergies, I think, push this towards a C+. Then we've got Strict Proctor, 2 mana for a 1-3 Spirit Cleric at rare, it flies, and whenever a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability to trigger, counters that ability unless its controller pays 2 generic mana. So this is, you know, equally likely to hurt you as it can potentially hurt the opponent. A 1-3 flyer for 2 is playable, you know, Concordia Pegasus is a, you know, filler card, not necessarily exciting. But uh, depending on how many ETB triggers you have in your own deck, it can hurt the opponent more than it can hurt you. So not super high on Strict Proctor, probably just a C, but uh, can be a playable filler card, once again a spirit, so gonna be at its best in red-white. Then we have Study Break, 2 mana instant that common, tapping up to 2 target creatures, and we get to learn. So tapping 2 target creatures not necessarily worth a card, but assuming we've got a good sideboard to learn from, then uh, we can make up for it. And, you know, tapping two creatures can potentially save us a lot of damage or enable a good attack. So it's not to be underestimated. Probably still get a, give a study break a C, just because of the learn mechanic. Thunderous Orator is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two core wizard at Uncommon. It has Vigilance, and when Orator attacks, it gains Flying until end of turn if we control a creature with Flying. And the same is true for First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, and Trample. Of course, Flying is probably the ability that's most relevant, and especially in Silver Quill, where we've got uh, Inkling tokens and other flyers, this is easily going to turn into a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two flyer, which is quite good, as it also keeps Vigilance. So I like C+, for Thunderous Orator. You do, of course, need other flyers to go with it, otherwise it's not super exciting, but definitely above the curve in terms of uh, two drops. And that's all the white cards taken care of. First blue card is Arcane Subtraction, so we're starting out with another Learn card. Two mana instant, giving target creature minus four minus so until end of turn. And we also get to learn, so assuming we've got cards in the sideboard to search up, this is pretty strong as we get a versatile combo trick that can either save life or potentially set up a favorable trade, and we get to get an extra card on top of it. So I like C plus for Arcane Subtraction. Next up we have Archmage Emeritus, a 4 mana 2-2 two -two human wizard at rare with Magecraft, saying whenever we cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, we get to draw a card. So this is about as powerful as it gets in terms of uh, Magecraft triggers. And assuming you're in blue, it's usually not too difficult to pick up lots of instants and sorceries. Of course, great alongside any learn cards that let us grab additional cards out of the sideboard. So I like A for Archmage Emeritus. Then we have a Burrug Befuddler, 2 mana, 2-1 two Frog Wizard at common with Flash, so we can play it at instant speed. When the Befuddler enters a battlefield, target creature an opponent controls gets a minus 1, minus 0 until end of turn. So not the most impactful shrinking of power, but it's definitely relevant, and 2-mana, uh, 2-1 two two with Flash plays nicely alongside other instants, potentially counter spells. So playable 2-drop, probably give this a C. Then we have Berry in Books, 5 mana for an instant at common, costs 2 generic mana, less to cast if it targets an attacking creature, and then we can put target creature into its owner's library, second from the top. This has a nice discount if it targets an attacking creature, so that's where it's going to be at its best. Overall, still not super high on Berry in Books, especially if you're looking to be a, a bit more aggressive and want to play this more as a tempo card and have to pay the full 5 mana. It gets a little bit pricey. Also nice against potential tokens, since those will be gone forever. So that's where it's going to be at its best when it's bouncing a uh, fractal creature, for instance. So overall, C for Barian books, but in some matchups it could overperform. Then we have Curate, a 2-mana instant at common, letting us take a look at the top two cards of our library, put any number of them into our graveyard, rest on top of our deck, and then we get to draw a card. Cheap cantrip enables Magecraft. It's definitely a filler card, not a very high priority, but if you're looking for additional 2-drops and you've got some Magecraft cards, you could do worse than Curate, so 
probably gets a C. Divide by zero, on the other hand, is a lot more exciting. A three mana instant at uncommon, saying return target spell or permanent with mana value one or greater to its owner's hand. That specific text means we cannot bounce any tokens, so bounce spells typically very good against tokens. Divide by zero, cannot bounce tokens to kind of make up for it. And then we also get to learn, so we get a bounce spell or a temporary counter spell. And on top of that, we get to learn as well, so this card kind of does it all. And happy to give this a B. Would easily be a B plus if we were handing those out. Dream Strix, a three mana. 3-2 Bird Illusion at rare, it flies, and when it becomes a target of a spell we have to sacrifice it, but when it dies we also get to learn. So we get an efficiently costed flyer, and when the opponent eventually has to deal with it, because a 3-2 flyer beats down pretty hard, then we still get some uh, card advantage out of it. So yeah, this card seems great. Easy B, B+, plus if we were giving B pluses. Don't think it quite gets to an A, but uh, definitely gets close. Next we have possibly the best blue common in the set with Frost Trickster, 3 mana, 2-2, two, two, flying bird wizard, and when it enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls, and it doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So it's a Frost Links that gain flying, and wizard also relevant creature type in the set. So this card seems amazing, easy B for Frost Trickster, and it's undoubtedly going to be the best blue common in the set. Then we've got another Mastery, Ingenious Mastery. This one's a little difficult to parse, so we can pay X, 2 and a blue, and then we get to draw X cards. So that's probably the mode we're most interested in. Or we can play this for 2 and a blue, and in that case we get to draw 3. But an opponent then gets to make 2 treasure tokens, and they get to scry 2. So that's giving the opponent a lot of extra resources here, which it's probably going to mean we're rarely going to cast this for 2 and a blue. But as a late game card draw spell, this could be okay if we've got a lot of mana to sink into it. Maybe we've got some cost reduction in the Prismari uh, College. So overall, Ingenious Mastery, not a super high grade, just because it's so mana intensive to use the better mode. Um, but a C for Ingenious Mastery seems fine. Then we have Kelpie Guide, 2 and a blue for a 2-2 beast at uncommon. Can tap to untap another target permanent we control. So we can always untap our lands to essentially ramp for one mana. And we can also in the late game, once we have 8 or more lands in play, tap the Kelpie Guide to tap target permanents. So all of a sudden this turns into kind of an icy manipulator where we can tap the opponent's creature, prevent it from attacking or potentially blocking. So I like a B for Kelpie Guide. Mentor's Guidance, 2 and a blue for a sorcery and uncommon. When we cast this, we can copy it if we control a Planeswalker, Cleric, Druid, Shaman, Warlock or Wizard. Wizard, of course, is going to be the creature type that's going to come up most often since there's a ton of those in the set. And then we get to scry one and then draw a card. So important to note about Mentor's Guidance, if we get to copy it, is that it will trigger Magecraft twice. So getting to do that can be incredibly relevant. And then if we get to scry one, draw card twice, you know, that's way better than a divination. So assuming we can enable it with enough wizards, this card seems great. So I'm happy to give this a B. Then we've got Mercurial Transformation, one on a blue for a sorcery at uncommon. This is also a lesson, so not a card we're going to main deck, but a card we're going to keep in the sideboard to search up. And then until end of turn, target a non-land permanent loses all abilities and becomes our choice of a blue frog with base power and toughness 1-1 one, one, or a blue octopus creature with base power 4-4. Four, four. Now this is a sorcery and the opponent will know about it beforehand when we search it up out of the sideboard. So it's not going to catch them off guard. That being said, it's still kind of a neat effect to have access to. We can potentially attack into the opponent's creatures if they block, even if they block one of our smaller creatures. We can second main phase play transformation, turn the opponent's creature into a 1-1 one, one, and it dies. We can maybe turn one of our small flyers into a 4-4 four, four, and get in a bit of extra damage. So it does have a bit of flexibility there. And uh, overall, as far as lesson cards go, you could do a lot uh, worse than this. So I still like a C for Mercurial Transformation. 
Then pop quiz, two and a blue for an instant, that lets us draw a card, it's a common, and we get to learn. So assuming we've got a nice sideboard, we can essentially draw two cards, one of which we get to choose. So yeah, I like pop quiz, C+, plus, assuming we have a nice sideboard. Then we have reject, one and a blue for an instant at common, which counters a creature or planeswalker, unless its controller pays three generic mana, and if it's countered, we exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard, which is added upside. So a bit of a conditional essence scatter, eh, not great, probably just a C, but uh, I could see playing this in a deck with a lot of other instants where it's not too difficult to keep up our mana. Then we have a Resculpt, one on a blue for an instant, saying exile a target artifact or creature, and its controller creates a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token. So unlike, let's say, Raven Form from Kaldheim, where we were usually targeting the opponent's stuff, this is one where you might want to target your own stuff and turn a small creature into a 4-4, maybe ambush the opponent's attacking creature with a 4-4, since this can be played at instant speed. That being said, still not super exciting, since we need to essentially sacrifice a creature or artifact. The fact that it works with artifacts potentially has a bit of synergy with treasure tokens, but overall not super high on Resculpt, so we'll give this a D. Then we have Serpentine Curve, 4 mana for a sorcery at common, creating a 0-0 green and blue fractal creature token, and then we put X plus one plus one counters on it, where X is 1, plus the total number of instant and sorcery cards we own in exile and in our graveyard. So in your average blue deck, maybe we've cast one author instant and sorcery by turn 4, so this would just make a 2-2 two -two creature, which is not too exciting. So this is definitely something we're looking to cast in late game, once we've got a full graveyard. And even then it might not be amazing. So not super high on Serpentine Curve. Uh, maybe has a bit of extra synergy in the Quandrix deck where we care about fractal tokens. Uh, this is like a low C, maybe even a D for Serpentine Curve. Snow Day is a 6 mana instant at Uncommon. Saying tap up to 2 target creatures and those creatures don't untap during their controller's next untap step. And on top of that, we get to draw two and then discard a card. So this card is very impactful. I uh, usually want to cast this during the opponent's turn. Their creatures don't get to attack for that turn, and they don't even untap during their next untap step, so it's almost like we're freezing their two best creatures for two entire turns. And as if that weren't enough, we also get to draw two and discard one, so we get a bit of card advantage and card selection. So while this is expensive at six mana, this is going to be an awesome finisher for any slightly more aggressive leaning deck. Although, as we've established, both blue-green and blue-reds typically want to play a slightly more controlling game and get to the late game, cast big expensive spells. So, you know, maybe not the best fit for the two colleges that... Uh, play blue, but even as a defensive card, this buys you a ton of time and gets you a bit of card advantage, so it still seems pretty good. So I think this is worthy of a B, just because of how impactful the card can be, but uh, maybe not the best fit for every blue deck. Probably going to be better in blue-green, I'm guessing, where you can apply more pressure with your green creatures. Then we have Solve the Equation, to and a blue for a sorcery at Uncommon, saying search your library for an instant or sorcery card, reveal it and put it into your hand. So a nice tutor effect for instants and sorceries. Typically tutors aren't great in limiteds, especially the ones that are somewhat conditional, that don't let you search for any specific card. At 3 mana this is also kind of pricey, so not the biggest fan of Solve the Equation. But maybe if you've got one powerful bomb, let's say you're a blue-red and you've got that uh, Magma Opus in your deck, I could see running a Solve the Equation to essentially get access to two copies. But uh, in your average deck, this is probably just a D and not a card I'm looking to play. Soothsayer adapts two mana for a 1-3 Merfolk Wizard. For one and a blue, we can tap it to draw a card and then discard a card. And it's also wizard, so that's a relevant creature type. So a nice early blocker, giving us a bit of card selection in the late game to get rid of extra lands we maybe don't need. 
Now, one thing to note is that both blue colleges do want access to a ton of mana, so the looting effect, while always valuable of course, is maybe a bit less valuable than it used to be, uh, just because both those colleges want access to a ton of mana, so discarding lands in a late game isn't always going to be as necessary. Uh, that being said, it's still a nice blocker to have against the more aggressive decks, and uh, has a bit of utility late game. So I still like a C for Soothsayer, even though we've maybe given similar creatures in the past a higher grade. The context of the set of course matters. Then Symmetry Sage is a 1 mana 2 human wizard at Uncommon with Flying and Magecraft. It says target creature we control has base power 2 until end of turn. So we could potentially turn the Sage itself into a 2 powered creature to get in a bit of evasive damage. As we've already looked at the multicolor cards and kind of got an idea of what blue-green and blue-red are all about. Symmetry Sage doesn't really have a ton of synergy in those two decks, maybe in the more aggressively slanted blue-red deck, but even there it's not incredibly exciting, and uh, triggering Magecraft more than once doesn't necessarily do much in uh, this case. So similar to the one mana uncommon in white, I'm also going to give this a D, but uh, maybe very specific aggressive blue decks can make use of this. Then Teachings of the Archaics is turn a blue for a sorcery lesson at rare, so another card we're going to keep in the sideboard, and if an opponent has more cards in hand than we do, we get to draw two cards, then we get to draw three cards instead if an opponent has at least four more cards in hand than we do. So usually not too difficult to turn this into a divination, and every now and then it'll draw us three cards, which seems great for a lesson that we can grab out of the sideboard. So yeah, as far as lessons go, this one seems quite good, and I'll give this a B. Tempted by the Auric is a 4 mana sorcery, although it's 1 and triple blue, so not the easiest to cast. It's rare, and for each opponent we gain control of up to one target creature or planeswalker that player controls with mana value 3 or less. So it's a mind control for smaller creatures, although once again keep in mind tokens have mana value of 0 once they're in play, so this can steal even a big fractal or a 4-4 elemental as well, which is uh, quite impactful. So the main thing that's keeping this card back is the mana cost being triple blue, which isn't the easiest, but the effect is certainly very impactful. So if the mana cost was easier, this would be an A. Uh, given the current mana cost, probably give it a B, probably B plus if we were giving B pluses. Test of Talents is one of the blue for an instant at Uncommon, saying a counter target instant or sorcery spell, and then we search its controller's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with the same name as that spell and exile them. And then they get to shuffle and draw a card if we exile something from their hand. So for the most part this is a slightly worse negate, um, which, you know, could be playable, especially when facing the Prismari College that's trying to cast expensive instants and sorceries. So somewhat conditional in nature, but could also be main decked, so probably lands on a C for Test of Talents. Then we have Vortex Runner, 2 and a blue for a 2-3 Human Wizard at common. As long as we have 8 or more lands in play, the runner gets plus 1 plus 0 and cannot be blocked. So definitely a card we're going to want in Quandrix uh, more than in Prismari, but even in Prismari it could be fine since that college is also looking to kind of ramp a little bit although it's going to be easier in blue-green. So 3 mana 2-3, not exciting, but if we get to 8 lands this turns into a great win condition. So yeah, I kind of like it in blue-green as an early blocker that then turns into a win condition as well. So C plus for Vortex Runner, assuming you're in Quandrix. Then Waterfall Aerialists is 4 mana for a 3-1 Jin Wizard at common with Flying and Ward 2. So if the opponent tries to target it, they have to pay 2 additional mana. So 3-1 flyer for 4 mana can hit pretty hard, difficult to remove thanks to ward. So that makes this a pretty decent card overall, C plus for Waterfall Aerialist. Then Wormhole Serpent is 4 and a blue for a 3-5 Serpent at Uncommon. 
And for 3 and a blue, has an activated ability, giving a target creature the ability to be unblockable until end of turn. So, not the best stats for a 5-drop, but it's a decent defensive card. So if it can stabilize the board, then the activated ability can potentially help us close out the game. Still not super thrilled about it, um, but it's a playable card, so probably just a C for Wormhole Serpent. And that's all of blue taken care of. Time to tackle black here. And our first card is Arrogant Poet. One on a black for a 2-1 Human Warlock at common. And when a poet attacks, you may pay 2 life. If you do, it gains flying until end of turn. So, at first glance, may not look amazing. But in the black-white Silver Quill decks, that could end up pretty aggressive. You're probably fine trading a bit of life to give this evasion, since you're going to be the aggressor and you don't care too much about losing a life of your own. And then a 2-power, 2-mana uh, evasive creature seems pretty strong. So I think Arrogant Poet's going to be a pretty defining card for the aggressive Silver Quill decks. And we've also seen a, a few flying synergies throughout the black-white Silver Quill cards. So I like C+, for Arrogant Poet. Baleful Mastery, another one of the Mastery rares, is a 4-mana instance, and we can exile target creature or planeswalker. can also have the flexibility of casting it for just one on a black, and if we do, then if the opponent also gets to draw a card. So probably want to cast this for 4-mana more often than not, but having the flexibility to cast it for 2-mana could be nice. So I like a B for Baleful Mastery. Then we have a Brackish Trudge, 2 and a black for a 4-2 Fungus Beast at Uncommon. It enters a battlefield tapped, and for 1 and a black we can return it from our graveyard to our hand, but we can only activate this if we gain life this turn. So this is going to be at its best in the black-green Witherbloom decks, where we've got a lot of small life gain synergies. And uh, a recursive 4-2 creature, doesn't mess around, can often trade for some pretty large creatures and uh, can't really be ignored dealing for damage each turn. Of course the fact that it comes into play tapped means we can block with it right away, otherwise it would be a little bit too powerful. But as is, it still seems great, can potentially play well with uh, sacrifice outlets as well. So I like a B for Brackish Trudge. Then Kalos Blood Mage, 2 and a black for a 2-1 Vampire Warlock at rare. When it enters the battlefield, we choose one between making a 1-1 pest token, drawing a card at the cost of one life, or exiling target player's graveyard. Probably gonna draw the card more often than not, but every now and then we might want a pest, especially in Witherbloom, and exiling the graveyard could sometimes be relevant against an opposing Witherbloom or potentially Lorehold deck. So overall, this card seems pretty good, easily gets a B. Then Confront the Past, X and a black for a Sorcery Lesson at rare. And uh, this one's pretty conditional in nature. We get to choose one between returning target Planeswalker card with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, or we can remove twice X loyalty counters from target Planeswalker an opponent controls. If we happen to have a Planeswalker or the opponent happens to have one, this could be a nice one to search up out of the sideboard. So I still like giving this a D, don't spend a very high pick on this, but it's going to be a nice one to get later. Then Crushing Disappointment, 3 and a black for an instant, at common, saying each player loses 2 life, and you draw 2 cards. Each opponent loses 2, so this is going to be slightly better in a more aggressive Silver Quill deck, where making the opponent lose 2 life is going to be more relevant than in, let's say, Witherbloom, but even in Witherbloom, you've got a bit of life gain to offset the life loss. So this is a fine card in probably both of the black colleges. And uh, yeah, still not a very high pick, but easily a playable card if you need a bit of card advantage. So Crushing Disappointment gets a C. Essence Infusion, one on a black for a sorcery at common, putting two plus one plus one counters on a target creature. It gains lifelink until end of turn. So this might be nice in the more aggressive Silver Quill decks where you may have some combo tricks to protect your creature afterwards. You can kind of see this as an aura, but it also has the added upside of 
potentially enabling some plus one plus one counter synergies and the lifelink you get temporarily is going to make it difficult for the opponent to race. So I don't hate Essence Infusion, assuming you can build around it a little bit. Going to be at its best if you've got some small evasive creatures that you can boost up. So C for Essence Infusion. Then I Twitch is a 1 mana 1-1 one, one I bat at Uncommon. It flies and when it dies you get to learn. So nice sacrifice fodder for any especially black green Wither Bloom decks. That's where this is going to be at its best, but any deck is going to be happy with Eye Twitch, assuming you've got some sideboard cards to search up. C plus for Eye Twitch. Flunk is one on a black for an instant at uncommon, giving target creature minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is 7 minus the number of cards in that creature's controller's hand. So it kind of scales naturally as the game progresses, not being able to kill very large stuff early on, which makes sense, but then late game it should be able to deal with pretty much anything. So yeah, for the most part if this reads 2 mana, kill a creature. And uh, yeah, that's a very efficient card, so B, probably B plus if we were giving B pluses. Go blank, 2 and a blank for a sorcery at uncommon, saying target player discards 2 cards and then exile all cards from that player's graveyard. So gonna be at its best against maybe a Witherbloom deck and maybe a Lorehold deck that might have some graveyard recursion. But uh, outside of sealed where Mind Rot effects can be quite good, I'm not super high on go blank in a draft environment where typically you don't want to spend three mana to make them discard two. Sadly doesn't have the same uh, utility as the discard effect from Kaldheim where we at least got to draw two if the opponent was empty-handed, which is of course the biggest problem with these types of discard effects. If the opponent doesn't have anything in hand, this uh, besides being called go blank is also going to be a blank in your hand. So D for go blank, but I could see this overperforming, especially against the Quandrix and Prismari colleges that might be trying to cast expensive spells and therefore might have more expensive cards stuck in their hand even in the late game. Then hunt for specimens, one on a black for a sorcery at common, creating a 1-1 pest token and we get to learn. So this card seems great, it's once again reminding me of uh, Elvish Visionary in that we get a small creature and we essentially get to draw a card, assuming we have some sideboard cards to find with a learn mechanic. So C plus for hunt for specimens. Lash of Malice is a 1 mana instant, giving target creature plus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. So occasionally this is going to be a pump spell, but for the most part we're looking to kill an opposing creature with toughness 2 or less, or maybe combine it with an attack to take out a larger creature. So a nice efficient removal spell, and this gets a C plus from me. Then Leech Fanatic is 1 on a black for a 2-2 human warlock at common and as long as it's our turn also has lifelink so it can potentially enable some life gain synergies. Nice if it gets additional plus one counters in black white so C plus for Leech Fanatic. Mage Hunter is three and a black for a 3-4 horror at uncommon and whenever an opponent casts or copies an instant or sorcery spell they lose one life. So can be pretty effective against specific decks that have a high density of instants and sorceries, 3-4 for 4, four. reasonable stats. So there's a lot to like about Mage Hunter, and overall give this a C+. Mage Hunter's Onslaught is a 4 mana sorcery at common, saying destroy target creature or planeswalker, and whenever a creature blocks this turn, its controller loses one life. So at its best, once again in the aggressive, black white silver quill decks but any blank deck is going to be very happy with this and this will probably be the best uh, black common in the set so this gets a b necrotic fumes is one and double black for a sorcery lesson at uncommon and as an additional cost to cast it we have to exile a creature we control and then we can exile target creature or planeswalker so this will shine in the black green wither bloom decks where we can easily get access to 1-1 pest tokens that we don't mind exiling. 
And yeah, as far as lessons go, having access to removal, even if it's maybe a bit difficult to set up, is still worthwhile. So Necrotic Fumes against a B. Novice Dissector, 3 in a black for a 3-3 three, three, Troll Warlock at common. For one mana we can sacrifice another creature to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. Can only be activated at sorcery speed. So a sacrifice outlet for the Witherbloom deck potentially. Not incredibly efficient or powerful. But if you're looking for a sacrifice outlet you could do worse. So C for Novice Dissector. Auric Allure Mage, 2 and double black for a 3-3 three, three, Human Warlock at rare. And it can tap to search your library for a card, put it into our graveyard, and then shuffle. If it's an instant or sorcery, we can put a plus one plus one counter on the lore mage. So this is an interesting card. Can potentially fill our graveyard, but typically instants and sorceries are cards we actively want to draw. So it can also help us thin out the deck, get rid of lands and other cards we don't want to draw. To improve our draw steps, maybe fill the graveyard for potential graveyard synergies. Overall, for mana 3-3, three, three, that can easily grow up to a 4-4, four, four, maybe 5-5, five, five before we start attacking and blocking with it. Uh, I guess it can block either way, and then still use the tap ability. So it's got some flexibility, and gives us some interesting options along the way. And uh, yeah, overall, stats are pretty efficient. So B for the Lore Mage. Then a Plum, the Forbidden. One on a black for an instant at uncommon, saying as an additional cost to cast it, we may sacrifice one or more creatures, and when we do, copy it for each creature sacrificed this way, and then we get to draw a card, and we lose one life. So if we just cast it without sacrificing anything, it's a pretty bad cantrip, but assuming we have some pests to sacrifice, for instance, this becomes a slightly more interesting card draw effect that can also trigger Magecraft multiple times, potentially. Yeah, a bit of a build-around card. I don't think the average deck is gonna be super interested in this, but a very dedicated token past the deck uh, might be more interested in this, so C for the Forbidden here. Poet's Quill, one on a black for an artifact equipment at rare, and when a quill enters a battlefield we learn, so that's already pretty decent. And on top of that we get this equipment that we can equip for one on a black, giving the equipped creature plus one plus one and lifelink. So incredibly difficult for the opponent to race, especially if we get this on an evasive creature. And we already get our card back through the learn mechanic. So Poet's Quill seems amazing and gets an A. And then Professor Onyx has to upstage the Poet's Quill here. Six mana, Planeswalker, starts out at five loyalty. And Magecrafts makes the opponent lose two life and we gain two life. Then the plus one makes us lose one life. We get to look at the top three cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, rest goes into our graveyard. Then the minus three makes each opponent sacrifice a creature with the greatest power among creatures they control. That's usually going to be their best creature. And then the minus eight ultimate makes each opponent discard a card, and if they don't, they lose three life, and we can repeat this process six more times. So that's usually gonna end the game on the spot. So Professor Onyx seems great. It's got built-in removal, it's got built-in card advantage, it's got built-in life gain and life loss. So it's kind of the full package, and just for six mana, so it's pretty feasible to cast this in any game where you draw it. So I think this is going to be one of the few S grades we're going to hand out for Strixhaven. Then Professor's Warning is a 1 mana instant at common, and we get to choose one between putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature, or target creature gains indestructible until end of turn. But uh, at the end of the day it's still a pretty low impact card, and uh, some removal spells even get around indestructible by exiling, so then it's not going to be too useful. So D for Professor's Warning. Promising a Dusk Mage, 2 and a black for a 2-3 Human Warlock at common. And when the Dusk Mage dies, if it had a plus one plus one counter on it, we get to draw a card. So, you know, it promises a little bit of upside. Problem is, we're not often going to be interested in putting a plus one counter on the Dusk Mage, since it doesn't have any evasive abilities. So it's for the most part just a 3 mana 2-3, which isn't incredibly exciting these days. So Dusk Mage gets a D. 
Then a Senchmore Witch, 2 and a black for a 3-2 Human Warlock and Rare with Menace. And then it has Ward, making the opponent pay 3 life if they want to target a Witch with any spell or ability. And on top of that we also have Magecraft, making a 1-1 black and green pest token whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell. So the Witch seems incredible, kind of has everything going for it. It's got a bit of evasion, generates a board advantage with the pest tokens, and if the opponent tries to remove it, they're at least gonna take three damage. So yeah, which seems great and gets an A, just incredibly efficient. Spectre of the Fence is three and a black for a two three Spectre at common, it flies. And for six mana, target opponent loses two life and we gain two life. So a nice mana sink ability if we don't have anything else going on. And a 2-3 flyer for 4 mana is, you know, not exciting but playable. So this is a C. Then a Tenured Ink Caster is 4 and a black for a 2-2 Vampire Warlock at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a target creature, including potentially the Ink Caster itself. And whenever a creature we control with a plus 1 counter on it, Attacks, each opponent loses one life, and we gain one life. So this card reads like it should be pretty powerful. And I'll admit it can be powerful, but it's only going to be great in a very dedicated plus one counter deck where you actively build around it, and pretty much any creature you play ends up with a plus one counter. If you're just playing your average black-white deck that may or may not have a couple counters here or there, then we're looking at a 5-mana 2-2, Ideally we put our counter on an evasive creature so it can keep attacking and triggering the ability, but then we're kind of running into the all eggs in one basket situation, opponent maybe finds an answer to your flyer, and now we're left with a 2-2 that, you know, isn't incredibly impactful. So I'm not loving the ink caster, but I could easily see a deck where this is going to be a card that overperforms and makes it impossible for the opponent to race. It's just a little bit on the pricey side, and if the board state isn't right for it, then we're kind of overpaying for a pretty mediocre card. So probably just give this a C, but uh, a bit of a build around card, so it could easily be a lot better in the right uh, deck. Then Umbral Juke, two and a black for an instant at Uncommon. We get to choose one between making a target player sacrifice a creature or a planeswalker, or making a 2-1 inkling token with flying. So nice versatile card, 2-1 flyer at instant speed is pretty decent and if the opponent only has the one big creature we can go for the sacrifice effect. So C plus for Umbral Juke. Then Unwilling Ingredient, so one mana, 1-1 one, one frog at common with menace. And for two and a black we can exile the ingredient from our graveyard and then we get to draw a card and lose one life. So it doesn't look like much, but there are a couple sacrifice synergies, especially once we get to green, we saw a couple in Wither Bloom already. So that's where the ingredient is going to be at its best. And 1-1 one, one Menace can usually chip in for a couple points early on, can then chum block, and then still draw a card later. So it does a lot for just one mana. So I like a C for unwilling ingredients, but in the right deck could easily overperform. First up is Academic Dispute, 1 mana instant at uncommon, saying target creature blocks this turn if able, and we may have it gain reach until end of turn. And on top of that we get to learn, so that's what we're most interested in, essentially a 1 mana cantrip that gives us a bit of selection over which card to search up. And the ability to force the opponent to block can potentially be quite relevant, so it's a 1 mana cantrip with potential upside. Now we cannot cast it unless there's a target in place, so we can't just run it out on turn one. We do need a target, so I guess that's the downside here. But assuming we can make use of the actual effect of Dispute, this seems like a pretty nice value card for just one mana. So I like C+, and again I'm potentially overvaluing all these learn cards, but uh, I'm pretty hopeful that these will be quite strong and limited. Then Ardent Dust Speaker, 4 in a red for a 3-4 Minotaur Shaman at Uncommon. This one's pretty complicated. When a Dust Speaker attacks, 
we may put an instant or sorcery card from our graveyard on the bottom of our library. So potential synergy here for Lorehold. If we do, exile the top two cards of our library and we may play those cards this turn. So a 3 4 4 5, not the best stance, and if it attacks to trigger its ability, the opponent's probably going to be able to take it out. So the ability better be worth it, and that's not always going to be the case. Under the right circumstances where we can safely attack with a Dust Speaker, maybe we can give it flying with that 2 mana 1 2 flyer we saw in white, then uh, we can potentially gain a bit of card advantage, but then again, if we had to use 4 mana to give it flying, we may not have a ton of uh, mana left to cast the cards we exile. So not loving the Dust Speaker, although under the right circumstances it can potentially provide a lot of card advantage. Just gonna start out with a conservative C. Then Blood Age General is 2 mana for a 2-2 two -two Spirit Warrior that can tap to give attacking spirits plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. So interesting interaction to point out if we can give General Vigilance, we can attack with it and then still tap it to pump up attacking spirits, since it doesn't specify other attacking spirits. And as we mentioned in red-white, there's a plethora of uh, spirit creatures between all the tokens and other creatures we've covered. So this is a great payoff card and at the same time it's a 2-drop, so you know, 2 mana 2-2 two -two that can attack and block early on with a nice bit of utility late game. Seems great. So, gets a C plus from me. Then Conspiracy Theorist is a 2 mana 2-2 two two at rare. It's a human shaman, and when the theorist attacks we may pay 1 mana and discard a card, and if we do draw a card. So it's a looter, but in order to enable it we need to attack, and a 2-2 two two usually doesn't attack very well, especially in the mid to late game, which is when looting is, is the most valuable. But there's more whenever we discard one or more non-land cards, we may exile one of them from our graveyard, and if we do, we may cast it this turn. So it's kind of like we're fake looting, we get to attack with a theorist, discard something and then still cast that card anyway. So it's a bit of a strange one. Um, of course, as far as two drops go, this is great, you'll always play this in any red deck, since it's just pure upside on top of a 2 mana 2-2, two -two, which is usually playable, so, you know, C plus for conspiracy theorist, also has additional synergy with other discard effects, since we don't necessarily need to be discarding the cards with the Theorist's ability. If we have, let's say, that red-white gold card from uh, Lorehold, which lets us discard 2 and draw 3, then uh, that can also potentially synergize with the Theorist, so keep those in mind. Then a Crackle with Power is another strange one, triple X in the casting cost and double red for a Mythic Rare Sorcery and then Crackle with Power deals 5 times X damage to each of up to X targets. So let's take a look at some examples. If X equals 1, it costs us 5 mana to deal 5 times 1 damage, so 5 damage to each of up to 1 target. So 5 mana for 5 damage, you know, not exciting, but it's a potentially playable removal spell. Now if we get to X equals 2, then we can start talking because now it's 8 mana, which, you know, is expensive, but Prismari especially has a couple ways to ramp into it. So for 8 mana we get to deal 10 damage to 2 creatures, so we get to kill 2 of the opponent's creatures, and pretty much any creature is going to die to 10 damage. So now this becomes a much more interesting removal option, with the flexibility, of course, of potentially casting it for x equals 1 as well. Crackle with power gets a B from me. The flexibility is what makes this powerful, but if we're only casting it for 5 mana, of course, then it's not that amazing. Draconic Intervention is 4 mana for a sorcery at rare, and as an additional cost to cast it, we have to exile an instant or sorcery card from our graveyard. So it's going to require a little bit of setup, and we can't always rely on it on turn 4, but then we get to deal X damage to each non-dragon creature, where X is the exile card's mana value, and if a creature dealt damage this way would die, it also gets exiled, and we have to exile Intervention. So it's a Sweeper that requires a bit of setup, but Sweepers in Limited are always powerful, and the exile effect can also be impactful, prevents the pest tokens from triggering, maybe some plus one counters are not going to get moved around. 
So those are all relevant interactions as well. So I like a B for Draconic Intervention. Has uh, potentially a lot of upside, even if it requires a bit of setup. Then Dragon's Approach is uh, not very good, can tell you that much. Two in a red for a sorcery at common, and it deals three damage to each opponent, and then we may exile Dragon's Approach and four cards named Dragon's Approach from our graveyard. If we do, search our library for a Dragon card and put it onto the battlefield. Now you may be wondering how can we possibly exile four other cards named Dragon's Approach? Well, a deck can have any number of cards named Dragon's Approach. Of course, not relevant for Limited, where we can play any number, but uh, for Constructed, this might be uh, important. So yeah, Dragon's Approach is just not a playable card in Limited. Three mana for three damage is not where you want to be. And uh, I doubt you're ever going to want to go for the deck where you've got multiples of these to try and cheat a dragon in place since you're just going to be dead by the time you cast enough of them. So this gets an F. Then Ifrit Flame Painter is 3 in red for a 1-4 Ifrit Shaman at rare. It's got double strike and when the Flame Painter deals combat damage to a player we may cast target instant or sorcery card from our graveyard without paying its mana cost and then exile it afterwards. And we can potentially trigger this twice thanks to double strike. Now of course the problem is going to be to get the flame painter to connect in the first place. One for double strike while it can survive a lot of situations doesn't necessarily uh, attack very well or uh, necessarily get to hit the opponent and there's not that many ways to grant it evasion. Maybe in a red white where we can give it flying this uh, can be pretty good. Don't love this card but the opponent always has to respect the ability and potentially keep some creatures back to try and block it. And in Prismari, we've seen some expensive instances of sorceries we can discard to make a treasure token. So we can maybe get the Flame Painter out on turn three. And then we already have a nice target waiting for us in the graveyard. So that's where this is going to be at its best. So overall, probably give the Flame Painter a C plus. A bit of a build around and not always going to be great, but the potential is there. Enthusiastic study is tuna red for an instant at common, giving target creature plus three plus one and trample until end of turn. And we get to learn a nice uh, combo trick that essentially draws us a card. So this is potentially a nice way to give our flame painter a chance to hit the opponent thanks to all the additional power and trample. So that's another way to potentially synergize with it. And by itself, even the three mana trick that it gets to learn seems quite strong. So happy to give this a C plus. Just pretty high on all these learn cards. Explosive Welcome is seven and a red, so eight mana total for an instant at uncommon, dealing five damage to any targets and three damage to any other target. And we get to add triple red to our mana pool to potentially still cast something else afterwards. Pretty expensive, but it is, you know, impactful once we do get to cast it. So assuming our deck is built around uh, casting expensive instants and sorceries, we should be able to make this work. Uh, I'll give Explosive Welcome a C. Fervent Mastery, part of the Mastery cycle. Sadly, this one's not all that great. Five mana, sorcery at rare. If we cast it for 5 mana, we get to search our library for up to 3 cards, put them into our hands, shuffle, and then discard 3 cards at random. Yeah, random makes this pretty unreliable, and if we're casting this with an almost empty hand, we're probably not going to be left with what we actually want to keep in our hand. If we play this for 4 mana, it doesn't get much better, because then an opponent discards any number of cards and then draws that many cards. So we're giving the opponent free card selection. So Fervent Mastery gets an F, but I'm curious to see some uh, constructed applications with this. First, the Day of Class is one on a red for an instant at common. And whenever a creature enters the battlefield under our control this turn, we can put a plus one counter on it and it gains haste until end of turn and we can learn. Of course, a problem with Casting this is that we might not have a ton of mana left to cast another creature afterwards. So not the best learn card, but almost all the learn cards seem playable to me. So still giving this a C. 
Fuming Effigies, 3 in red for a 4-3 Spirit at common, and whenever one or more cards leave our graveyard, Effigy deals 1 damage to each opponent. So there's a bit of synergy in the Lorehold deck, it's also Spirit to potentially pick up additional bonuses. That being said, nothing special here, just a fine playable filler card, so it gets a C. Grinning Ignus is 2 in a red for an elemental at uncommon. This is a reprint. It's a 2 2, and for 1 red mana, we can return Ignus to its owner's hand and then add double colorless mana and a red mana and can only be activated at sorcery speed. So the idea behind Grinning Ignus is that it can ramp us into those expensive Prismari instants and sorceries, and this essentially ramps us by 2 mana. So if we play turn 3 Grinning Ignus, then on turn 6, for instance, we could uh, use the ability and then cast an 8 mana sorcery, or turn 5, cast a 7 mana one. So in a Prismari deck, I could see Ignus being okay. That being said, it's just a 3 mana 2-2, two -two, which aren't so great stats. But uh, hopefully casting those expensive spells will make up for it. So C for Grinning Ignus, but might be a high priority in a deck with a lot of expensive cards. Then Hall Monitor is 1 mana for a 1-1 one, one Lizard Shaman at Uncommon. It's got haste, and for 1 mana red we can tap it to give target creature cannot block until end of turn. Can be a nice ability in an aggressive deck, although we do have to pay 2 mana for it, which is not nothing. And uh, as far as the red decks go, Prismari not particularly aggressive, and then the uh, Lorehold deck is also not particularly aggressive, typically wants to kind of sit back and use some graveyard synergies. So Hall Monitor doesn't really seem to have a great home in this set, so I'm gonna give it a D, just uh, a bit lost here in the hallways. Then Heated Debate is 2 in a red for an instant at common, cannot be countered and deals 4 damage to target creature or planeswalker. So very nice efficient removal spell, Easy B, going to be one of the better commons in red. And Igneous Inspiration has to one-up our previous card, dealing 3 damage to any target. At sorcery speed, this is an uncommon, but we get to learn, so it's essentially 3 damage, and we get to draw a card of our choice out of our sideboard, and if we don't have any, we can always discard and draw. So this card seems great, B, easy B+, plus if we were handing out those B pluses. Then Illuminate History, 2 and double red for a rare sorcery lesson. So this is going to live in our sideboards, letting us discard any number of cards and then draw that many cards. And if there are 7 or more cards in our graveyard, we get to make a 3-2 spirit token as well. So it shouldn't be too difficult to get the spirit token. And uh, yeah, getting a nice looting effect, especially for Lesson, which are typically a little bit underpowered for what we're paying for it, because we're paying for the flexibility. This seems uh, quite strong, and it's going to give us a nice way to get rid of lands in the late game. So especially synergistic in Lorehold, but even the Prismari decks are going to be happy to pick this up. So I like a B for Illuminate History. Illustrious Historian is one red for a 2-1 Human Shaman at common, and for 5 mana we can exile it from our graveyard to create a 3-2 Spirit token. So a 2-drop that when it trades off eventually turns into a 3-2, although it is kind of pricey to do so, has a bit of synergy for the Lorehold decks. So yeah, seems good. Uh, C, maybe even a C plus for Illustrious Historian as we're happy to trade it off, but of course the opponent's going to know that and potentially uh, avoid trading their more valuable 2-drop for it. Then Mascot Interception, 3 in a red for a sorcery at uncommon, costs 3 less to cast if it targets a creature token, and then we can gain control of target creature until end of turn, untap it, gets plus 2 plus 0, and haste until end of turn. So your typical act of treason with a bit of extra flavor. Not great, there's not really a supported red-black sacrifice archetype, as far as I'm aware of, although I guess you can always try it out. But uh, I'm gonna start with D for mascot interception. Then Pigment Storm, 5 mana sorcery at common, deals 5 damage to target creature, and excess damage is dealt to its creature's controller instead. So yeah, a bit of an expensive removal spell, but it'll get the job done 
and maybe give you some incidental damage. So C plus for Pigment Storm. And then a Pillar Drop Warden is 3 in a red for a 1-5 Spirit Dwarf at common. It has reach. And for 2 mana we can tap and sacrifice a Warden to return an instant or sorcery card from our graveyard to our hand. Can only be used at sorcery speed. So blocker early on. Can even block flyers. And then late game once we need to get back a powerful instant or sorcery we can sacrifice it. So yeah, seems like a nice defensive card in both the Lorehold and Prismari decks. So C for Pillar Drop Warden, not particularly efficient, but definitely an, a helpful role player. Retriever Phoenix, 3 in a red for a 2-2 Phoenix at rare. It has Flying and Haste, and when it enters a battlefield, if we cast it, we get to learn. So this seems great, 2-2 Flying Haste, that essentially draws a card. Seems very good, and there's more as long as the phoenix is in our graveyard. If we would learn, we may instead return the phoenix to the battlefield. So it has a bit of recursion if we have more learn cards, and uh, especially if we're out of cards in the sideboard to search up, that might be better than using the draw discard effect. So yeah, phoenix seems great, and gets at the very least a B, probably would be a B plus. Then start from scratch is turn a red for a sorcery a lesson at uncommon, and we can choose one between dealing one damage to any target or destroying target artifact. So we mentioned there not being a ton of artifacts in the set, but that being said, the few artifacts that we'll see play are going to be pretty impactful. So having a way to destroy them, especially as a card we can grab out of the sideboard, gives us a lot of extra flexibility, and every now and then. The opponent will have a valuable one toughness creature that we can take out. So there's a lot to like about start from scratch as a lesson to keep in the sideboard. Not a card I'm interested to ever main deck. So we'll give this a C. Then Stormkiln Artist is 3 in a red for a 2-2 Dwarf Shaman at Uncommon. Gets plus 1 plus 0 for each artifact we control. And Magecraft creates a treasure token. So at first glance this didn't seem great, but once you take into account the context of Prismari wanting to cast those expensive instants and sorceries, you can sort of stomach the expensive costs versus low power and toughness initially. So overall, still not super high on the artist since it both needs to survive as a 4 mana 2-2, which is pretty small, and then also needs additional enablers to help us ramp into those expensive cards in the first place but potentially has some neat synergies with some of the Storm cards that we'll see in the Mystical Archives, and some of the other cards that we've seen that can potentially cast multiple spells with only the one card. So overall, give this a C. Then Sudden Breakthrough is one in a red for an instant at common, giving target creature plus two plus zero and first strike until end of turn. So reminiscent of Sure Strike, we lose one power, but in return we get to make a treasure token, so very useful if we're ramping into expensive cards. So overall, definitely liking Sudden Breakthrough as a combo trick, even if it might not have a great home for it, since the uh, Prismari decks are probably not going to be super interested in a combo trick if they're trying to play a more controlling game. So overall I'll give this a C, but we'll have to see where this uh, ends up. Tome Shredder is to in a red for a 2-2 wolf at common, has haste, and can tap to exile an instant or sorcery card from our graveyard to put a plus one plus one counter on it. So has a bit of exile synergy with lore holds, but Prismari is probably the college where we're gonna have the highest density of instants and sorceries. So there's a bit of tension there. Three mana two two hastes can maybe sneak in an attack or two, but pretty Quickly it's going to be forced to pick up counters before it can be relevant in combat again. And there's not going to be infinite food for it in the graveyard. So definitely worse, I think, than let's say something like Spellgorge or Weird, where you can be attacking and growing it at the same time, whereas this you have to make a decision each turn. But it still seems playable, so I'll probably give this a C. Then a Twin Scroll Shaman, 2 in a red for a 1-2 Dwarf Shaman with Double Strike. So... Not particularly synergistic in any of the two uh, colleges. Double Strike pairs nicely with combo tricks, 
So that's where you want to make use of the Twin Scroll Shaman, I suppose. Now we'll give this a C, but this might not have a great home. First, the green card is Accomplished Alchemist. 3 and a green for a 2-5 Elf Druid at rare. Can tap to add 1 mana of any color, or can tap to add X mana of any one color where X is the amount of life we gained this turn. Probably not going to gain life super often, uh, so we're mostly evaluating 4 mana 2-5 that ramps for 1. Still seems nice in the Quandrix decks where you're interested in casting some expensive spells potentially and a 2-5 blocks relatively well. So, I like the uh, Alchemist quite a bit. C plus seems appropriate, but might be slightly better in a deck with a few more life gain synergies to go with it. Then basic Conjuration, 1 and double green for a Sorcery, Lesson and a Rare. Let's just take a look at the top 6 cards of our library and reveal a creature card from among them to put into our hand. And the rest goes on the bottom, and we gain 3 life. So, can usually find a creature, and then we get to gain a bit of life, so... It's a slow card, uh, since we need to cast a card to learn, then we need to find this under the sideboard, cast this, find a creature... But in the meantime, at least we gain a bit of life to offset the tempo disadvantage, but it will eventually find a creature. So, we will eventually get our value, and... Uh, you know, lessons don't need to be super incredible to be worth taking early, since we want to make sure that all our learn cards are, uh, you know, gonna grab something out of the sideboard. So overall, still like a B for basic conjuration. Next up, we have a Bayou Groff, one on a green for a 5-4 plant dog at common. And as an additional cost to cast it, we have to sacrifice a creature or pay 3 generic mana. So this is a card that synergizes incredibly well with the Unwilling Ingredient. So green-black with a turn 1 Unwilling Ingredient is kind of where you want to be. And then we get access to a 2-mana 5-4. That's going to beat down incredibly hard. And of course we can easily sacrifice some uh, Pest tokens as well. Also plays well with Eye Twitch in black, another 1-drop we can easily sacrifice. So those are kind of the synergies you want to look for. If you don't have any of them, then the value of the Biograph goes down. But assuming you've got some cheap sacrifice fodder, this is going to be a great 2-drop to have access to, even if you're not necessarily casting it on turn 2. So I like C for Biograph, but can easily go up to a C plus, or maybe even a B minus if you have one of those 1-drops you can sacrifice. Then big play, 1 and a green for an instant at common. Target creature gets plus 2 plus 2 and gains a reach until end of turn, and we also put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So pretty powerful combo trick, all things considered, since we get that plus 1 plus 1 counter as a nice leftover. Uh, once again, there's not going to be that many decks where this is going to be a great fit, since black-green is more about sacrificing stuff, and blue-green is more about ramping, so none of those decks necessarily want access to a ton of combo tricks, but there's nothing wrong with the card inherently. So we'll start out with a C for big play, but I'm not sure it's gonna see a ton of play. Bookworm is 7 and a green for a 7-7 seven, seven worm at uncommon. It tramples, and when it enters a battlefield we gain 3 life and draw a card. And for 2 and a green we can put Bookworm from our graveyard into our library, third from the top. This card has a couple synergies, especially once we get to the Mystical Archive cards, as we'll see. But uh, yeah, even by itself, 8 mana is expensive, but there's a lot of support and there's quite a few ramp cards to help us get the Bookworm out there. And it is impactful, 7-7 seven, seven Trample, cannot be chum blocked, gains immediate value when it enters, and if the opponent can't exile it, it will just keep on coming back. So... I'm a fan of the Bookworm, might be overrating it slightly here, but I'm gonna give it a B. And it also hinges on some of those Mystical Archive cards that synergize with it. Then Charge Through is a 1 mana instant at common, giving target creature Trample until end of turn and we get to draw a card. So it's a cantrip, although do keep in mind that you do need to have a target in play before you can cast it, so you can't always just cycle it on turn 1. As far as cantrips go, 
this one isn't bad, giving a big fractal token trample, especially with that rare that we saw earlier, is gonna be very nice. So yeah, charge through just a C, fine filler card, and gonna shine in blue-green. Containment Breach, two and a green for a sorcery lesson at Uncommon, saying destroy target artifact or enchantment. If the mana value was two or less, we also get to make a 1-1 one -one pest token. So a very nice lesson to have access to in the sideboard. Never gonna main deck this, but a very versatile sideboard card. So as far as lessons go, this one is pretty high up there. So C plus for Containment Breach. It's like we get to main deck a very situational sideboard card that could be very effective. Then Devouring Tendrils is one in the green for a sorcery and uncommon. Target creature we control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker we don't control. So essentially Rabbit Bite. And when the permanent we don't control dies, this turn we also gain two life. So Rabbit Bite with upside gets a B from me. Then a Dragon's Guard Elite, one on a green for a creature, human druid at rare, with Magecraft putting a plus one plus one counter on it. So a two drop with that ability is incredibly strong. And then for four and double green, we get to double the number of plus one counters on the Dragon Guard Elite. So this can easily get out of hand in the late game, and it's a very powerful two drop to start out with. So something that's a good early game and potentially very strong late game should have our attention, and uh, yeah, I think I'm giving the Elite an A. Ecological Appreciation is X, 2, and a green for a Mythic Rare Sorcery that lets us search our library and graveyard for up to four creature cards with different names that each have mana value X or less and reveal them. Opponent chooses two of them, we shuffle the chosen cards into our library and the rest on the battlefield. It's a little pricey, opponent's has a lot of agency over what ends up on the battlefield. Assuming we have a lot of expensive cards to search up and we can grab four somewhat valuable cards, then uh, you know we can definitely get our value out of the ecological appreciation. So I like a C for ecological appreciation. Uh, not amazing, but potentially a nice finisher. Emergent Sequence, 2 mana, Sorcery at Uncommon, lets us search our library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tapped and then shuffle. Land becomes a 0-0 green and blue fractal creature token that's still a land, and we put a plus one plus one counter on it for each land we had entered the battlefield under our control this turn. So if we cast this on turn 2, if we've already played a land, get to search up another land, creature becomes a 2-2. So this is an interesting take on Rampant Growth as we both get to search up a land, but it also turns into a creature, so for Constructed, probably going to be worse than Rampant Growth, since the opponent can actually interact with our creature. As far as Limited goes, we get a creature and we get to ramp, great for Quandrix that wants to get up to 8 lands, so happy giving this a B. Next up we've got Exponential Growth, double X and double green for a Sorcery at Rare, until end of turn, double target creature's power X times. So sorcery speed means the opponent's not going to be caught off guard. If we can target a flying creature, then maybe it doesn't matter, because we can just uh, add a ton of power and toughness to the board, or I guess power in this case, and potentially one hit KO the opponent. So if we're in blue-green and we have a couple flying creatures, then this could be an interesting way to close out the game. Not a very high pick, but uh, can definitely close out games out of nowhere. So probably a card you're gonna lose to at some point in this format, but that doesn't make it a very high pick. So I think D for exponential growth, not super high on it, but uh, it has some interesting applications. Field Trip is amazing, two and a green for a sorcery at common, lets us search our library for a basic forest card, put that card on the battlefield, tapped, and then we get to shuffle and we get to learn. So we not only get to ramp, which is great, especially for Quandrix, we also get to learn, essentially draw a card. So this is not too far from Cultivate, might be even better in some cases where we just want more action. So I like B for Field Trip, card seems great. 
Then Fortifying Draught is single green for an instant at uncommon. We gain two life and then target creature gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the amount of life we gained this turn. Once again, comma tricks don't necessarily have a great home. This does have a little bit of life gain synergy, which could be nice in some of the black green decks. It's a playable card, but it's not an exciting card, so it gets a C. Then Gnarled Professor to end double green for a 5 4 3 4 Druid at rare. It tramples, and when it enters a battlefield, we learn. So this seems amazing. We get a very efficiently costed creature that essentially draws a card when it enters a battlefield, assuming we drafted some lessons during the drafting portion to put in our sideboard. So Professor gets an A, just very efficient and powerful. Then Honor Troll to an green for a 2 3 Troll Druid at Uncommon has Vigilance. And if we would gain life, we gain that much life plus one instead, and gets plus two plus one as long as we have 25 or more life. So potentially grows up to a 4 4, but that's going to require quite a bit of life gain. So don't expect that to happen very often. But you know, a 2 3 Vigilance with a bit of added upside. This is going to shine in black green where we can sacrifice some pests. So. Still gets a C plus, but uh, yeah, don't overvalue the life gain necessarily. Karok Wrangler for an green for a three three, Elf Druid at uncommon, and Magecraft puts a plus one plus one counter on a target creature we control. So very nice uh, ability. Three three for five is <clears throat> maybe a little bit overpriced, but assuming we can trigger Magecraft a few times, we can quickly make up for it. And the fact that we can potentially trigger this at instant speed can catch the opponent off guard. And getting to choose where to put the counter is also a big deal, since we can potentially put this on an evasive creature or some other creature to set up better attacks. Give this a B. Then Leyline Invocation, 5 and a green for a source rate common, creating a 0 0 green and blue fractal creature token. Can put X plus one plus one counters on it, where X is the number of lands we control. So assuming we just have six lands in play, this is going to make a 6-6. No evasive abilities, not especially powerful, but if our deck needs a curve topper, then uh, this will do. So D for Leyline Invocation, playable under some rare circumstances. Then Mage Duel is two and a green for a sorcery at common, and it costs two less to cast if we've cast another instant or sorcery spell this turn. And then target creature we control gets plus one plus two until end of turn. And then it fights target creature we don't control. So a very efficient fight spell potentially. Yeah, the plus one plus two bonus is very relevant when it comes to winning the fight. So seems like one of the better green commons. And gets a B from me. So alongside field trip, this is probably going to be one of the premier commons in green. Then Master Symmetrist is 2 and double green for a 4-4 four, four Rhino Druid at Uncommon. Has Reach, and whenever a creature we control with power equal to its toughness attacks, it gains Trample until end of turn. So already 4-4 four, four, for 4 mana with Reach is reasonable, and then it has even more upside with that uh, ability. So Master Symmetrist seems great, good synergy with uh, Fractals as well. So I like a B for Master Symmetrists. Then Overgrown Arch, one on a green for an 0-4 Plant Wall with Defender at Uncommon. Can tap to gain one life, and then for two mana we can sacrifice it to learn and potentially grab a card out of the sideboard. So very nice defensive card, um, can stall out the game, especially valuable in the blue-green deck that wants to be ramping and just needs to buy time to cast its powerful late-game spells. But even in the black-green deck we might have some cool life gain synergies like we saw with the 4-2 that can return from the graveyard. And yeah, an 0-4 blocks pretty well, gains life, so very annoying for the aggressive decks to get past. And then at some point if we don't need it as a blocker we can cash it in for a card. So yeah, liking the arch a lot and uh, give this a B as well. Professor of Zoomancy, 3 and a green for a bear druid at common. It's a 4-3, that when it enters a battlefield creates a pest token. So quite the upgrade over Elder Leaf Mentor. And uh, yeah, overall, pretty efficient card. Always happy to have this. C plus for the Professor. 
Reckless Amplimancer is 1 on a green for a 2 2 elf druid at common. And for 4 on a green, we can double its power and toughness until end of turn. So, very reminiscent of the 2 mana 2 2 from uh, Ravnica that got plus 2 plus 2. This one doubles its power, so even better since we can potentially put a counter on it and then it gets even more power. Or if we ever get to 10 mana, we can turn this into an 8 8. So, that's pretty sweet. But overall, as far as 2 drops go, this one's pretty strong. The threat of activation is what makes this so powerful and uh, can often sneak into damage even if we're not actually going to pump it. So I like C plus for the Amplimancer. Then a Skurret Colony 2 mana 2-2 two, two, Squirrel at common has reach and gets plus 2 plus 2 as long as we control 8 or more lands. So 2-2 two, two, reach lines up pretty well against a lot of the flyers in uh, Strixhaven. We've seen a lot of 2-1 flyers, we've seen a couple 3-1 flyers too. So it can potentially block and trade for those. And if we get to the late game with 8 lands, having a 4-4 reach is quite the upgrade. So there's a lot to like about uh, Colony. So we'll give this a C plus as well. Then we've got Spined Karok. 2 and a green for a 2-4 Crocodile. Just a nice vanilla creature. Nothing special, no cool synergies. But if we need a 3-drop blocker, especially in Quandrix, this will do. So a D for Spined Karok. Probably not going to play it often but a fine curve filler if we need it to be. And Spring Main Servan is next, a 3 mana 3-2 three, that when it enters a battlefield we gain 2 life. So a virtual reprint of uh, Brush Strider, I believe. Slightly different creature type, but uh, yeah, still a playable card if we need a curve filler. This one probably goes up to a C, since at least it beats down a little bit better. And uh, yeah, nothing wrong with the card, just not going to make the deck every time if we've got better 3-drops to choose from. Then a Tangle Trap is 1 on a green for an instant at common. Let's just choose one between dealing 5 damage to target creature with flying or destroying target artifact. So this is strictly a sideboard card and sadly it's not a lesson. So it's not going to be a very high priority but in best of 3 this will be a fine card to have access to. But uh, just gets a D. And then Verdant Mastery is 5 and a green for a sorcery at rare. Now this one, if we cast it for 6 mana, we can search or library for up to 4 basic land cards, put 2 of them into play tapped, and then the other 2 can go into our hand. If instead we cast it for 4 mana, still get to search for 4 lands, 2 of them go into play tapped under our control, 1 of them goes into play tapped under the opponent's control, and then the fourth land we get to put into our hand as well. So either way, even if we cast it for four mana, we're still ahead on cards over the opponent. And of course, more importantly, we are ramping. So especially in Quandrix, where we want to ramp into some big spells, this is going to be a very nice way to do so. And this can also maybe enable us to splash, can maybe set up for a nice teamer deck where we've got expensive Prismari instants and sorceries to cast. So there's a lot to like about Verdant Mastery and uh, happy giving this a B, even if sometimes it'll give the opponent an extra land. And yeah, those are all the monocolored cards taken care of. We're going to take a look at all the colorless cards, artifacts and lands. And then afterwards we'll take a look at the mystical archive cards. So first up we have another lesson. Environmental Sciences is two mana. For a colorless sorcery lesson at common, letting a search or library for a basic land card reveal it, put it into our hand and then shuffle, and we gain to life. So a nice bit of uh, mana fixing, doesn't ramp, but does help us sort out our colors if we're playing a multicolor deck perhaps. And uh, yeah, just a nice lesson to have access to for just looking for more lands to keep ramping and hitting our land drops. So I like a C, maybe even a C plus for environmental sciences. Next we've got Expanded Anatomy, another 3 mana sorcery lesson at common, putting 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on a target creature. And it gains Vigilance until end of turn. Definitely not a card you're ever gonna main deck, but as far as sideboard lessons go, this can be a nice one, especially paired with maybe an evasive creature. So C plus for Expanded Anatomy. Introduction to Annihilation is a 5 mana sorcery removal spell at common. 
another lesson, exiling target non-land permanent and its controller draws a card. So only really want to use this on an otherwise uh, very problematic creature since giving the opponent an extra card is a real drawback. But having access to removal, especially on a lesson, is still pretty nice. So C plus for introduction to annihilation, then introduction to prophecies, a three mana sorcery lesson that lets us scry to and then draw a card. Some nice uh, preordain action and uh, we are paying a price for it, three mana isn't cheap. Essentially means that our lesson lets us uh, draw an extra card and another way to potentially trigger those magecraft triggers as well. So C plus for introduction to prophecy. And then mascot exhibition is our final colorless sorcery lesson. This is seven mana to essentially make all the different uh, tokens. We get to make a 2-1 white and black inkling, a 3-2 red and white spirit, and a 4-4 blue and red elemental token. So we're not getting the 1-1 one, one, and we're not getting the uh, fractal token, but still a lot of creatures for seven mana. And the fact that this is colorless means we can play this in any deck and uh, any card that lets us learn can search it up. So it makes this a very valuable first pick since it can go in pretty much any deck. And I'll give this an A. Then explore the vast lands is the back half of Wandering Archaic, a 5 mana 4-4 four, four avatar at rare, saying whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, they may pay 2 generic mana. If they don't, we may copy that spell and choose new targets for the copy. Yeah, that seems quite powerful. 5 mana 4-4, four, four, maybe a little bit overcosted for the stats, but the ability more than makes up for it. Now, when it comes to the other half, uh, it's a little bit less exciting. Explore the vast lands, a three mana sorcery, saying each player looks at the top five cards of their library, reveals a land card and or an instant or sorcery card from among them, puts the cards they revealed this way into their hands and the rest on the bottom of their library in a random order and each player gains three life. So the fact that this is symmetrical means we're very rarely gonna wanna cast this unless we absolutely need to hit our land drops for some reason. But the creature half is quite good, and I'll give a B here overall. Then Biblioplex Assistant, a 4 mana 2 one gargoyle at common. It's an artifact creature, has flying, and when the assistant enters a battlefield, put up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard on top of your library. A little bit overpriced at 4 mana, the effect can be nice, but you're not always going to have something to put back. So I'm a little bit underwhelmed by the assistant, but if you need a filler 4 drop, I guess you could do worse. But uh, I'll give this a D. Campus guides a 2 mana 2-1 two golem artifact creature, and when it enters, can search our library for a basic land card, reveal it, and put it on top of our deck. So not exciting, but can help us hit our land drops, potentially fix our mana as well. So just a fine filler C. Cody Vociferous Codex is a pretty interesting one. A 3 mana, 1-4 legendary artifact creature construct at rare. This is definitely a build around card. Ideally you can open Cody, pack one, pick one and kind of build around it. Otherwise you might have wasted a lot of picks. Says you cannot cast permanent spells. And then for 4 mana we can tap it to add all 5 colors to our mana pool. And when we cast our next spell this turn, exile cards from the top of our library until we exile an instant or sorcery card with lesser mana value. And until end of turn we may cast that card without paying its mana cost and put each other card exiled this way on the bottom of our library in a random order. So this wants to go in a very spell heavy deck. Ideally, we can make creatures using the various summoning cards, making those creature tokens, so we can still get a bit of a board presence despite not casting any permanent spells. Can uh, definitely pull us pretty far ahead with all those extra cards we get from the ability, which also, you know, ramps us, providing one extra mana. Definitely build around cards, and it's going to be difficult to make it work if you're opening this later in the draft. But assuming you get this back one, pick one. Seems like a fun challenge, and uh, we'll give Cody a B. Then a Cogwork Archivists, a 6 mana, 4, 5 artifact creature construct with reach at common. For 2 mana can tap it to put a card from our graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. 
So if games get incredibly grindy, this is a way to avoid uh, milling yourself. But it's definitely overpriced at 6 mana, so not a very high pick. We'll give this a D. Then Excavated Wall is a 1 mana 04 artifact creature wall with Defender at common. For 1 mana can tap it to mill a card. So maybe there's some Lorehold decks out there that want to just fill the graveyard and then try and get some value that way. And then we can maybe use the previous card to prevent decking and make some sort of weird engine where you try to put your entire library into the graveyard and kind of recycle it. So there might be something there. But uh, I'll give this a D starting out. Letter of Acceptance, a 3 mana artifact that common can tap to add 1 mana of any color, and for 2 mana can tap and sacrifice it to draw a card. So especially the Quandrix and Prismari colleges are going to be interested in the extra ramp and potential mana fixing, and then later can always cash it in for an extra card. So seems like a fine serviceable card in some decks, so we'll give this a C. Then Reflective Golem is a 3 mana 2-3 artifact creature golem at uncommon, and whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only Reflective Golem can pay 2 mana, and if we do, copy that spell and choose new targets for that copy. So yeah, there's not that many cards that synergize with Reflective Golem. We're mostly looking at pump spells. Not a huge fan of it, but you might find some cool synergies along the way. I'll start out with a C for Reflective Golem. Spell Satchel is 2 mana for an uncommon artifact with Magecraft, putting a book counter on it, can tap it and remove a book counter to add colorless mana, and for 3 mana we can tap it and remove 3 counters to draw a card. Seems like a lot of work for not a lot of payoff, um, can maybe help us ramp in some Prismari decks, but uh, overall not the biggest fan. We'll give this a D. Strixhaven Stadium, 3 mana artifact at a rare, taps for colorless mana and then puts a point counter on it and then has a whole mini game where if you get 10 counters you win the game but if you are dealt damage the opponent can remove counters from it and if you deal damage you add counters. And it's probably not going to come up very often since by the time you get 10 counters on it the opponent's probably taken uh, lethal damage already. So we're mostly looking at a 3 mana artifact that taps for colorless and that's it. So it's worse than the uh, letter of acceptance. So we'll give this a D. Then Team Penance is a 1 mana artifact equipment at uncommon. Equipped creature gets plus 1 plus 1, has vigilance and trample. Equips 2 tokens for just 1 mana, so great alongside the various summonings. And then equips 2 regular creatures for 3 mana. So. You know, assuming you've got a lot of tokens, then this could be serviceable, especially nice with fractals, giving those trample is a big deal. But uh, if you don't have a lot of tokens, this is pretty inefficient. So Team Penance gets a C. Now Zephyr Boots, on the other hand, seem quite powerful. A 1 mana equipment at uncommon, and equips for just 2 mana, giving the equipped creature flying, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card and then discard a card. So very cheap to play and equip, flying is a very useful ability, and getting to draw and discard makes this even better, so B for Zephyr Boots seems great. Then we get to the lands, where we start out with Access Tunnel, Colorless Land taps for Colorless Mana, and for 3 mana we can tap it to give a creature with power 3 or less unblockable until end of turn. So probably going to shine in the aggressive black-white silver quill decks where you want a lot of uh, cheap creatures to eventually give some evasion to close out the game. Uh, having a colorless land in your mana base is a significant cost, so it is not without potential risk of mana issues that you put this in your deck, but the payoff is potentially there, so uh, assuming you're aggressive and you've got cheap creatures to target, this could be a serviceable utility land, so we'll give this an overall score of C+. Then Archway Commons is a land, enters battlefield tapped, and when it enters we have to sacrifice it unless we pay 1 mana, and then taps for 1 mana of any color. 
So it's sort of like a gateway plaza, except it's not a gate. So not a very high pick. Um, there might be a few multicolor decks in Strixhaven, especially Teamer is kind of my initial expectation. So there you might want the Archway Commons. But having to pay one mana, having to wait until at least turn two before you can play it is a significant drawback. So probably just a C for Archway Commons. Then the Biblioplex is an interesting one. A rare land, Tempest for Colorless, and for two mana we can tap it, look at the top card of our library. If it's an instant or sorcery, we can reveal it and put it into our hand. If we don't put that card into our hand, we can put it into our graveyard. So gives us a nice bit of card filtering and potential card advantage, but we can only activate this if we have exactly zero or seven cards in hand. Yeah, if you're in kind of top deck mode where you're just hoping to find action, Biblioplex is going to be amazing. Probably not going to get to the point where you've got seven cards in hand and are still activating this as opposed to adding more to the board. But the situation where we are empty handed could often come up, can always activate this in our upkeep as well. So overall, I like Biblioplex as a utility land, probably at its best in a very rampy Prismari deck. Uh, where you can always potentially discard some of your more expensive cards to make treasure tokens to enable Biblioplex. The power level is definitely there, especially in lengthy, grindy games. So we'll give this a B. Then there's the Snarl Cycle. So these are the new dual lands at rare. They enter the battlefield tapped, unless you reveal an island or mountain in this case. And then it enters untapped and taps for both blue and red. So a nice cycle of lands. Interestingly, I'm not sure that these are better than the common variants, which we'll get to in a second, but I'll give the Snarls a common grade of C+. And then we've got Hall of Oracles, a rare land, taps for colorless. For one mana we can tap it to add one mana of any color, so makes it slightly more expensive, but fixes our mana. But we can also tap it and put a plus one plus one counter on target creature can only activate this at sorcery speed and only if we've cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn. Getting some plus one plus one counters every now and then can make a pretty big difference and yeah, I mean, doesn't take much to get a few of them going. So I like B for Hall of Oracles as well. And then we get to the campus cycle. So these are the common dual lands, they enter the battlefield tapped. And for 4 mana we can also tap it to scry 1, so it gives us access to a bit of card selection in the late game. Very useful if you're flooding out a bit. So we'll give all the campus lands a C plus a grade as well. So same grade as the snarls. And I'm not sure which ones are going to be the better ones between the two. For limited I could see the campus as being more valuable. And those are all the snarls and campus lands. And that brings us back to where we started. So last but not least, we're going to take a look at the Mystical Archive cards, which are going to be present in every Strixhaven booster, including Draft. So we definitely have to look at these and evaluate them accordingly, since you're going to see a lot of these going around. So we're going to start with White, and our first card is Approach of the Second Sun. Probably don't need to read all the cards since you're going to be familiar with most of them. But uh, 7 mana, alternate win condition, gains a bit of life. And if you've got additional card draw effects to find approach a second time, it can potentially speed up the process. So this is probably going to be at its best in a lore hold deck, especially alongside a lore hold excavation where we can mill some of our top cards to redraw approach a second time. Yeah, it seems quite nice. So I'll give approach a B. Next up, Day of Judgment, Powerful Sweeper. This gets an A grade. There's uh, no real drawbacks here, just a nice clean 4 mana sweeper. Defiant Strike, 1 mana comma trick. Let's just draw a card, give plus 1 plus 0. So, especially nice in a Silver Quill deck that's looking for some cheap ways to enable Magecraft. So, overall, just a C, nothing special here. Divine Gambit, already reprinted from Kaldheim. Don't think I've ever seen this cast in my time playing Kaldheim Limited, but in theory it's a playable card if you can cast it in the late game without giving the opponents too much of an advantage. But at the end of the day it just gets a, a C rating. 
Ephemerates is also reprinted here. This one is pretty interesting. It's uh, potentially a way for us to enable Magecraft twice for just one mana, as it has Rebound. There's not a ton of creatures with Enter the Battlefield abilities that we can enable with Ephemerate, but it is a way to potentially save a creature from removal, and then with Rebound we can still potentially enable a uh, Magecraft ability a second time. So interesting card, uh, not especially powerful or synergistic in this set, but uh, you know, the card itself can definitely set up some cool interactions and will have some constructed applications, I'm sure. So overall gets a C. Then a Gift of Estates is a 2-mana sorcery, and if an opponent controls more lands than we do, we get to search our library for up to 3 planes cards, reveal them, and put them into our hand. So this is going to be much better if we're on the draw than if we're on the play, because then we don't have to awkwardly wait until the opponent plays an extra land, can just, before playing the land for the turn, cast Gift to get our 3 planes, and uh, that's a nice 3 for 1. Also going to be better in Lore Holds, where we've got additional ways of discarding cards from our hand, so we can potentially turn those planes in the late game into actual cards. So that's uh, another synergy you want to watch out for. Overall, give this a C+. God's Willing, a nice combo trick. Potentially saving a creature or protection can allow us to attack past a bunch of blockers, so this is going to be great in an aggressive Silver Quill deck. Overall gets a C+. Mana Tithe is going to be a fun meme, and every time the opponent's got white mana untapped, you'll have to make sure to play your lands before casting your spells, just in case the opponent has a Mana Tithe to counter target spell unless its controller pays one. But overall, not a great card, so it gets a D. Then Revitalize, reprinted once again, gain 3 draw card. Nothing special, but it's a cantrip if we need a way to enable Magecraft. It gets a C. Next up we have Swords to Plowshares, probably the most efficient removal spell ever printed. 1 mana instant to exile a creature, and its controller gains life equal to its power. You know, perfect removal spell, better in slightly more controlling decks as opposed to the more aggressive ones, where the life gain could matter, but uh, doesn't get much better than this in terms of spot removal. Still not gonna quite give it an A, but if we were handing out B pluses, this would be a B plus plus. Then Teferi's Protection. It's uh, a little complicated with phasing out. If you're not sure what phasing out means, don't worry, since I don't think this card's gonna see much play. So we'll just give this a D and move on. Then Blue Sun's Zenith is X and triple blue for an instant, and we get to draw X cards and shuffle the Zenith back into our library. Yeah, not a very efficient card if we're casting it for small amounts, but if we can generate a lot of mana, this will be a nice way to take over the game. Overall, give this a B. Then Brainstorm. We'll finally see some play on Arena. One mana instance, get to draw three, put two cards from our hand on top of our library in any order. At its best, if we have ways to shuffle our deck or get rid of those top cards in case we don't want them. But even as a one mana cantrip, it can help us set up our next couple turns a little bit better and then we'll eventually redraw the cards we put back on top, especially in a set with so many Magecraft synergies, having a 1-mana cantrip seems nice. So I still like a C plus for Brainstorm, even if we won't have a ton of shuffle effects. Compulsive Research, 2 and a blue for a sorcery, letting us draw 3 cards, and then we discard 2 unless we discard a land card. So this is at its best in the late game if we don't need any more lands. Just a very efficient card draw spell and happy giving this a B. Counter spell is back, double blue to counter target spell, so very efficient. Not too difficult to keep up double blue, unlike some of the three mana counter spells, and it's unconditional, so we'll give counter spell a B. Memory lapse is kind of a temporary counter spell, so the way you want to use memory lapse is to gain kind of a tempo advantage by countering an expensive spell, and then forcing the opponent to spend more mana casting it again, while we've only spent two mana on memory lapse. So this is at its best in a more tempo-oriented deck where you're looking to close out the game quickly, but any blue deck is going to be reasonably happy to have it, since it can usually uh, trade for more of the opponent's mana than we spent on memory lapse. So I like C+. Then Mind's Desire, six mana, storm card here. 
probably not going to get to cast multiple spells in the same turn to enable this, so we'll give this an F. Negate, find sideboard cards. We gave a similar two mana counter spell a C, I believe. So negate gets a C as well. Then we've got opt, single blue to scry one draw card. We all know this one. Similar to brainstorm, nice to have a one mana cantrip in a set with a lot of magecraft synergy. So we'll give this a C plus. Then strategic planning, a little bit inefficient at two mana as far as cantrips go. But uh, yeah, if you need a two mana cantrip, this will do. So we'll give this a C. And then Tesseret's Gambit uses Phyrexian mana, so don't be afraid to just spend three mana on this and pay two life. Also means we can cast this in a non-blue deck, so that opens it up to pretty much every deck out there. And then we get to draw two and then proliferate. So this is probably going to be at its best in black-white, where you get to proliferate those plus one plus one counters. So despite being a blue card, this is probably more of a black-white card. And uh, yeah, any deck's happy to have this, and we'll give this a B. And then Time Warp, 5 mana to take an extra turn. Not always going to be amazing if you're not ahead on board where you can set up profitable attacks, but uh, can never be too bad since you just get to draw an extra card. And if you've got a lot of mana, potentially add to the board besides casting Time Warp. So it gets a B. And then Whirlwind Denial, not the best counter spell out there. 3 mana is pretty pricey, but uh, can potentially be nice against uh, storm cards i guess but overall still gets a d then we get to black where we've got agonizing remorse two mana discard spell from theros c plus fine card crux of fate is a five mana sweeper destroying all dragons or non-dragons there's not too many dragons in the set besides the uh, elder dragons for every college so for the most part this is just five mana wipe the board which is an A for limited. Dark Ritual is an interesting one to evaluate. Yeah, I'll have to play a couple games with Dark Ritual before I can really gauge its power level, so I'm probably going to be slightly off on this one. But it's a card that has potential, as we all know. Of course, limited is a bit different from constructed. We're not ending the game on turn three or four necessarily, uh, which is where Dark Ritual shines. So I'll start out with a conservative C on Dark Ritual, but uh, could definitely still overperform and end up with a higher rating. Then Demonic Tutor, two mana to search for any card in our deck. Now, I mentioned earlier that I'm not a huge fan of tutor cards, but Demonic Tutor is about as efficient as it gets. And uh, if you've got any bombs or cool synergies, Demonic Tutor can help you search those up. So I like B for Demonic Tutor. A Doomblade, very efficient removal spell, destroying target non-black creature, gets a B as well. Duress, a bit conditional as far as discard spells go, never really gets a high grade, so we'll give Duress a D. Eliminate, nice removal spell, destroying a creature or planeswalker with mana value 3 or less. And not quite as good as Doomblade, since it doesn't necessarily kill big stuff, although that being said, there are tokens in the set and uh, those still have mana value zero. I initially gave this a C plus. I could see this being a B, although it's like a B minus if we were handing out B minuses, uh, just because it can deal with large tokens potentially. Yeah, we'll go with a, a B for eliminate. Then Inquisition of Kozilek, a nice one mana discard spell for constructed, for limited, only being able to take cards with mana value three or less makes this uh, a little bit weak since it doesn't get the most impactful cards that you care about. It doesn't always even uh, get removal spells out of the opponent's hand. So not super high on Inquisition, we'll give that a D. Then we've got Sign in Blood, two mana draw spell that costs two life, can also potentially use it as a way to target the opponent to deal two damage to them. So this is going to be at its best in an aggressive Silver Quill deck where both modes of card advantage for two mana and potentially dealing two damage could be relevant. But uh, yeah, efficient, even if it's uh, a little bit difficult to cast, requiring double black. So can always cast it on turn two. But uh, definitely a fine card that I'm happy giving a C plus. Then Tainted Pact. I'll give you as a reading assignment, um, but I'm just going to give it a D. 
Then Tendrils of Agony, 4 mana for a Storm card. Target player loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. I don't think Storm's gonna be a very big uh, theme in Limited. There's a few Storm cards, of course, they synergize with Magecraft as well. So those are kind of the synergies you want to look out for. I guess you can live the dream with Dark Ritual and Tendrils of Agony. But at the end of the day, uh, probably more of a build around card than actually a good card. So I'll give Tendrils a D. Village Rites, one mana instant, sack a creature to draw two. There's not a huge sacrifice theme in the set, so maybe not as good as it would be if we had more Act of Treason effects. That being said, it does play well with the pest tokens, especially in black green. So there's where you potentially want access to village rights. So still probably give this a C plus. It's never a terrible card, but especially in black green, it's gonna shine. Then we get to red, where we've got Chaos Warp, a very weird removal spell that shuffles a permanent back into its owner's library. And then they get to reveal the top card of their library, and if it's a permanent, put it on the battlefield. So they're not guaranteed to get a card back, but more often than not, they'll at least get a land or another creature. This is, I guess, potentially a nice answer to some bombs, but the opponent will get to shuffle them back, so they can eventually redraw that same card that you'll then have to deal with. So it's kind of a clunky, awkward removal spell at best. So I'll give this a D. Then Claim the Firstborn, again there's not a huge uh, steal and sacrifice theme, but I guess Claim the Firstborn can pair with your village rights, but then we're in black-red, which is not a supported college color, so that's gonna make it tricky to get a good deck since you'll miss out on all those powerful multicolor cards. So overall give this a D. Faithless Looting now is inherently card disadvantage, since we're drawing two and then discarding two, and we've had to use a card to get that effect, but we also get to flash it back, so we're getting a ton of card selection at the cost of one card basically. This could be nice in a red-white Lorehold deck where we can maybe make use of some cards in the graveyard. Also a nice one to combine with the Gift of Estates that we mentioned earlier, so those are kind of the synergies you want to look for. Overall, not a super high grade for Faithless Looting, but it's always at least playable, so we'll give this a C. Then Grapeshot, another Storm card, dealing one damage to any target. And of course Storm for those that aren't familiar, when we cast this spell, copy it for each spell cast before it this turn, and we may choose new targets for the copies. And uh, since Magecraft specifically mentions copies also triggering it, that means that the Grape Shot's a nice Magecraft enabler. Two mana is pretty cheap, so it's not too difficult to cast one or two spells before it and uh, get a nice bit of value. So yeah, in an aggressive, maybe blue-red Magecraft deck, Grape Shot could do a lot of work. Uh, still a little bit conditional and a bit of a build-around card, so not every red deck is going to be interested, but we'll give Grape Shot a C. Increasing Vengeance, double red for an instant. That copies the next instant or sorcery spell we control. And then can also flash it back out of the graveyard for three and double reds. And now we get to copy that spell twice instead. So similar comments as I had about the uh, Teach by Example, the Prismari hybrid card for two mana. And uh, I think I'm going to give this the same grade, which is a D. Flashing this back for 5 mana makes it difficult to cast another spell alongside it, since most uh, instants and sorceries are going to be at least 2 mana. So a bit clunky, but potentially has some synergy if you can discard it and then late game maybe flash it back and cast a relatively cheap spell twice. So, you know, it's not completely unplayable, but just don't overvalue it. Then Infuriate, fine pump spell for 1 mana if you need a pump spell. So we'll give this a C. Lightning Bolt is great. Best uh, burn spell ever printed, basically. One mana for three damage to any target. So this gets an easy B, would be a B plus, alongside uh, Swords to Plowshares if we gave B pluses. Then Mizzix Mastery is three in red for a sorcery that essentially flashes back an instant or sorcery from our graveyard. And then 
I can also overload it for five and triple red. So Mizzix Mastery has quite a bit of synergy with the Prismari cards, since we can potentially discard those, make a treasure, and then Mizzix Mastery can cast them for four mana as opposed to seven or eight mana. So that's kind of the synergy you want to go for. Uh, overloading this for eight mana could come up, and of course it's going to be powerful because then you get to essentially cast all the cards out of your graveyard, which seems pretty good. So yeah, interesting build around for the Prismari decks. So if you pick up a Mizzix Mastery, look for those treasure sorceries and instants. And overall we'll give this a C+. Then we've got Shock, not as good as Lightning Bolt, but still pretty decent. One mana burn spell dealing two damage to any target. Give this a C+. And Stone Rain, some land destruction, usually not great for limited, although can potentially uh, get the opponent nicely every once in a while. But I'm not going to recommend main decking this, so we'll give this a D, but maybe an interesting sideboard card against someone that's getting a bit too greedy with their mana base. Thrill of Possibility, another fine looting effect, similar to Faithless Looting, although this one at least isn't inherent card disadvantage, but it just doesn't let us dig as deep as Faithless Looting, so we'll give this the same grade of C. And then Urza's Rage, two and a red for an instant, cannot be countered, deals three damage to any targets, so already just a fine removal spell, and also as kicker for eight and a red, so it's a pretty pricey to kick it, but then it deals 10 damage to any targets, so potentially a nice finisher in a Prismari deck that has access to a bit of ramp. Overall gets a B, mostly just for the three mana half. And then we get to green, where we've got Abundant Harvest. This one's pretty interesting, a one mana sorcery. We choose land or non-land, and then we reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal a card of the chosen kind, and then put that card into our hand, Rust goes on the bottom. So, you know, if we need additional lands, this can help us hit our land drops. And if we're in the late game and have all the lands we need, this will make sure we at least find a spell, even if it's maybe not our preferred spell. So, you know, it's a playable one mana sorcery, enables magecraft, but uh, at the end of the day, just a C, nothing special. Adventurous Impulse is pretty similar. We can look at the top three, reveal a creature or land card from among them and put it into our hand. Rest goes on the bottom. So, fine way to filter through the deck and potentially enable Magecraft. Gets a C as well. Channel is a very interesting one. Two mana sorcery. Until end of turn, any time we could activate a mana ability, we may pay one life, and if we do, add colorless mana. So this seems like an awesome combo with the Bookworm, for instance, that we saw in green. Since on turn three, we can cast Channel. Of course, we do need triple green for this to work, so it's going to require a bit of build around. But assuming we have three forests in play, can play Channel, and then we pay, uh, I guess, seven life to add seven colorless, still tap our forest for green mana, cast a turn three Bookworm, gain three life back, draw a card. So that's the type of thing you want to try and accomplish when you put channel in your deck. So it's definitely a build around card, uh, can potentially help you double or triple spell in the mid to late game. There's no fireballs to synergize with it, sadly, but uh, you can always use promo code LVD at checkout and get my personal token for free. But going back to the set review, I'm definitely looking forward to trying out some decks where we get to abuse this uh, powerful magic staple. So at the end of the day, uh, we'll give this a C. Not going to be for every green deck, but uh, definitely going to be a fun challenge. Then we've got Cultivates, great ramp spell, lets us put a land in play, one in our hand, and uh, yeah, enables Magecraft, perfect for ramping in your Quandrix decks. Cultivate seems great and gets a B. Harmonize is another great one, for mana to draw three. So excellent card draw spell in green, gets a B as well. Crows and Grip, pretty conditional disenchant effect, has split second, so essentially cannot be countered or responded in any way, shape or form. But uh, don't really need sideboard cards like Crows and Grip when we've got lessons that do the same job and are quite a bit more flexible. 
And then Natural Order, another very powerful card from Magic's history. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to sacrifice a green creature and then search our library for a green creature card and put it on the battlefield. So similar to Channel, this also synergizes nicely with expensive green creatures like Bookworm. Here we can sacrifice any green creature, including potentially a black green pest token, and then search up any green card in our deck, or any green creature card I should specify. I think this gets a higher grade than Channel because of that, so we'll go with C plus for Natural Order, although it's still a bit of a build around card, and if you don't have any expensive green creatures, of course, you're probably not going to want this. Then Primal Command, very powerful sorcery. Get to choose two modes between target player gains seven, put target non-creature permanent on top of its owner's library. That also includes lands, so we can set the opponent back a turn. Target player shuffles their graveyard into their library, potential graveyard hate or anti-mill technology, and search your library for a creature card, reveal it, put it into your hands, and then shuffle. So the modes we're gonna use most often are gonna be to search for a creature, and put a non-creature permanent on top of its owner's library, setting the opponent back a turn on mana development. So Primal Command's powerful, flexible, and gets a B. Then Regrowth to mana sorcery returns a card from our graveyard to our hand. So, you know, nice to get back a removal spell as well, and can get back one of our bombs that maybe got dealt with as long as it didn't get exiled. So fine card and gets a C. Snakeskin Veil, reprinted from Kaltheim already. Probably going to be a bit weaker here than it was in Kaltheim, since the green decks are trying to do a slightly different thing. Still potentially nice to protect one of your fractal tokens in the Quandrix deck, but it'll go for a C for Snakeskin Veil. And then Weather the Storm, another Storm card. This one just gains a bunch of life. Not super interesting unless you've got a lot of uh, Magecraft synergy, so we'll give this a D. And then we get to the multicolor archive cards where we've got the spark, two mana instant, exiling a permanent with mana value four or greater. So very efficient, doesn't deal with uh, tokens all that well, but overall still a very powerful removal spell that will give a B. We've got electrolyze in blue red, two damage divided as we choose among one or two targets and we get to draw a card. So this is kind of the perfect answer to multiple inkling tokens in black white. And uh, yeah, just a great card all around, gets a B. Grow Spiral in blue-green, this time around blue-green is interested in ramping and putting extra lands in play, so better than the first appearance in Limited, and uh, we'll give this a C+. Lightning Helix, amazing reprint as well here, dealing 3 damage to any targets and gain 3 life. Gets a B, just a very efficient removal spell, would get a B plus if we were handing those out. And then Putrefying, Black Green, 3 mana instant, destroying a target artifact or creature. Cannot be regenerated, not super relevant for limited, but just a nice removal spell in general. So that gets a B as well. And there we go. Those are all the cards from the main set, plus all the archive cards, which will come across in limited, since there's one in every Strixhaven draft booster. And I'm pretty sure that there's going to be one lesson card in each booster as well, plus potentially additional ones in the uncommon slot. So we can expect to see plenty of lessons and plenty of uh, mystical archive cards go around, so they will have a big impact on the limited environment. And we'll see whether or not the lesson cards end up being as powerful as I'm kind of expecting them to be. And uh, yeah, as always, you can check out the updated spreadsheet that I keep on my Discord server, as we'll definitely be upgrading a lot of the limited ratings over time as we get to play the set more and uh, get to find out which cards overperform and underperform. So if you're a patron or Twitch subscriber, you'll get access to those at all times, as well as all my other limited spreadsheets and other cool perks that you get for being part of the community. On that note, I think we're gonna wrap up the stream for today. Sadly, as you may know, there's not going to be an early access event this time around, but maybe I'll still end up uh, streaming a draft or two once the set releases on Arena. But for now, I want to thank everyone for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.